Very good morning to you. Welcome along to OTB AM this Wednesday morning, and it is our one-year anniversary. It's Halloween, everybody. Um, I don't know what genius thought it would be a good idea to start a show on Halloween, but we did anyway, and we've had a pretty interesting year. We're going to play you some clips from uh, our best stuff across the year. Before I get to tell you what's coming up, Owen is here. Morning. How are you? Very well. How are you? Good. Happy Halloween. Happy Dave, Halloween. how are you? Happy Halloween morning. How are you? Very good, yeah. Are you dressing up? Uh, I'll probably have to throw something on me, yeah. Um, before I hit the street. Yeah. What have you got lying around? I don't know. I th there's probably a mask. I w it won't be a certainly won't be a full body thing. It'll just be throw the mask on, tick the box. What are the lads wearing? The, um, the uh, elder boy is wearing a full body skeleton costume. Oh yeah. Which he's been banging on about for weeks. Pretty handy because he just pull up. <coughs> yeah, exactly. No and uh, the smaller guy, he wants to be Batman. Problem is the Batman costume is is that of the older fella and it's probably a bit too big we may have to roll the sleeves up 50 percent and indeed the legs but look yeah. we'll make do very good uh, i'll tell you what's coming up right now here we go uh so camp apocalypse i'm not going to tell you any more about it you're just gonna have to wait a full three minutes before i actually play you the video and explain what the hell's going on but owen is shifting uneasily on his seat he's blowing out his arsehole at the moment going what have i done you know, yeah, anyway, uh, we're, we're bringing some of our best stuff right across the day. And it's like little snippets of our best stuff, so uh, we won't be taking you out of um, today for too long. But we are looking back on a pretty interesting year in uh, sports broadcasting history, certainly our sports broadcasting history. We've got the Sports News for you. Dave's here all afternoon, all morning with us, rather, instead of all afternoon. That second espresso has gone straight to my head. Uh, we'll talk about the GAA fixtures first. The club champion in Wicklow had to play two games in two days. It's absolutely ridiculous. We're going to speak with their manager about how that situation impacted his team and just how unfair the whole thing was. And, uh, of course, we're running through the sports pages. But before all that, it is time to bring you... I mean, we, we, look, we've covered loads of stuff. We've had the, the Mountain talking about Conor McGregor. We've had Danny Duff calling um, the powers that be in the GAA dinosaurs. We've had Tyke Furlong explaining exactly what drove him to be one of the best rugby players in the world and maybe our best athlete uh, over the course of the last year but we didn't actually at any point really understand that the biggest story we would ever cover would break last night have a look would you fight him on i would totally fight this guy would you yeah i'm calling him out right now Tony mcgregor big news for fight fans the mcgregor camp are staying tight-lipped on reports that they are lining up a fight in december the mcgregor in question the champion of coinage tony mcgregor no one gives me a coinage. Owen, you called out Tony. He has yet to respond. People reckon it'll be at the RDS. It'll be in December. That's the picture. We know they spelled your name wrong, but we won't hold it against them. <laughs> <laughs> Owen, Tony hasn't responded yet. Why the Tony hasn't responded, to be honest? Like, who would respond to my fearsome calling out of that man? Is Tony McGregor afraid of you, Owen? Of course he is. Uh, it'll feel like a, a bottle of whiskey is smashed over your head when I'm finished with you, Tony. This is psychological warfare. You can't back down this easily. This is the yeah, fight come game. Come on. Tony, Tony, Tony <laughs> McGregor doesn't understand the fight game. Two days ago, you were telling him, I'm going to leave you alone, old man, because I would kill you. Well, I would. And, uh, you know, for the sake of uh, that old man's brain, I better not call him out. What? A minute ago, you said you could take him. Yeah, I would, but... Then wanna, tell him you take him. I want to spare the poor old man's head. Eating your turkey or drinking There'll your be turkey? a belt on one shoulder and a belt on the other shoulder. A belt on one and a belt on the other. Darren, what have you done? I don't know. I, I've you've <laughs> made a showreel. I've made a showreel. It's a good showreel, yeah. You've, uh, you, you've come across quite well in that. I think we've got to a point where there's no backing down. Like, you Come on, do it. What are you talking to me for? Do it. Me backing down? Yeah. I'm not going to back down. <laughs> <laughs> one for the showreel. We've actually had a response from Tony McGregor. Um, few could have predicted that, but he responded to Owen quite publicly yesterday with the picture of him on the dock in the Nespresso machine, and he informed <laughs> Owen, he made a grievous tread on Owen, that he would be eating turkey through a straw, but he hit you with the Nespresso machine. But he has Instagram DM'd me on, and he said, tell him the easiest thing is opening up a can of whoop ass. It's a bit more difficult trying to put it back in. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. 
Tony this is real. Tony continues yes. by. These are real DMs. Yeah, they're, they're real DMs. What? Oh, hold them up. They're real DMs. Yeah, yeah. I thought this was all made up. No, this is real. What? Yeah. We've been talking to Tony. Um, it's game on as far as I'm concerned, continues Tony. At 1600 hours today, I initiated Camp Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. In all caps, it started. Jerkin. Holy from shit. The veracity of those uh, DMs. Pretty chill about it all, to be honest. Camp Apocalypse, Camp Ishmocalypse, <laughs> what, whatever, whatever it may be. Have you begun preparations? Because Tony has. Well, I'm born ready, to be quite honest with you. I was, uh, I was put on this planet to fight all men like him. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's genuinely up for this own. Are you genuinely up for this? What, what are you why are you trying to insult my sincerity here this morning? Well, can we do it before Christmas? Because you're talking about you need to be able to drink in November and December. Can we do it before Christmas? But if I'm going to be able to drink in November and December, then you know, um, I'll just I, I, I like whatever whenever you say whenever the deal is, um, whatever it may be. You know, I was as I say, I was born ready. Um, I might just not be available on the day that's on the poster. Have you ever been in a fight in your life? No. So, in, by reverse, you've never lost a fight in your life. Well, exactly. Andy, Andy Lee can give you um, like proper how to slip and and you know we can get you. I mean, movement. Maybe, yeah, I, I mean, maybe Brian just could give you some kind of weights training, some kind of like explosiveness. Uh, Digger Forum can teach you which drugs to take. You know, we're. Oh, we're I've started on drugs. drugs. <laughs> I am off my tits on EPO this morning, ladies and gentlemen. So. Uh, because there is not a strict testing regime with. There will be no testing drugs. regime for this one, no. <laughs> no, it's for charity, so testing doesn't come into it. No, it's great. It, like, who wouldn't want to knock a guy out while high on drugs for a charity? That's, that's exactly <laughs> what all my dreams are made of. We just want you to survive three rounds, that's yeah. all. Three, three two minute rounds. Well, you know, as, as long as I survive without being arrested, then I'll be happy with, it, with the bodily harm that I'm going to aggravate on him. So there's the camera. Tell Tony that Camp Apocalypse, Camp Ishmocalypse, you're coming for him. I just said that, Darren. It's, it's okay. Well, tell him again. It's okay. You know, you, know, you know how I feel, Tony. You know how I feel. <laughs> I genuinely believe this is going to happen. The longer it's gone on, the more I genuinely getting, uh, can picture it. I think you're getting a little bit aroused at this idea, Darren. You're, you're extremely excited by, uh, by this whole thing. It's just the most ridiculous thing in the world of the most famous sports person on the planet in the moment, and you're going to fight his dad. Well, it's not, what's ridiculous about it? Are you saying that you looked at his DMs and didn't take them with full sincerity? Oh, no, now I took the DMs with full sincerity. It's a case of he's either taking the piss or you should change what route you take to work. <laughs> I'm going to take the same route to work. <coughs> That's how serious this is. Are we is. talking boxing or MMA here? Boxing, boxing. I think, yeah. Boxing. Okay, straight up boxing match. Have you ever taken a punch? Um, no. You've Not never been hit in the face in your entire life. Have huh? you been hit in the face? Ah, oh, yeah, loads yeah. of times. Like, loads of times? loads. At least more than three. In a football match? Football matches on the street. On the street? Yeah. Somebody boxing punched you on the street? Yeah. About three or four times, yeah. What? <laughs> Did you deserve it? In, on three or four different occasions, okay. not like not three or four punches in the same move. And no, no one gets more than one in on Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's your chief <laughs> shot, then you'll fall. I mean, there's never a need for a second. <laughs> I'm, I'm down. I'm I'm crying for my mama after the first punch. Yeah, I've taken some punches to the face. Doesn't mean I could. I'm actually getting better at being able to take them, but it's just a question that you probably need to ask yourself: Have you ever taken a punch to the face? You know, ev everybody's got a plan until they get uh, boxed in the face. Exactly. Is how it goes. But we've uh, got like six weeks to get you ready for this. You'll be grand. Oh, grand! Your brain can regenerate. <laughs> My brain is not going to be touched. It will be this unetched piece of perfection uh, by the end of this, and uh, I will be holding whatever belt there is aloft. You lose more brain cells listening to that shite you call music anyway. Uh, <laughs> Isol Cody says, So, at Owen Sheehan is going as Casper the Friendly Ghost for Halloween as he pales worryingly on set. <laughs> oh. Now, Isol is calling you out. You're having a bad week with She's people calling, calling you She's calling for uh, Jer against uh, Gareth A as well on the undercard. That's probably going to be a, a better fight. No, I don't think so. Yeah, that'd be a good fight. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a father. I've got to, you know, look after. I've got to worry about my children. So is Tony. And Tony's kids are going to be orphans. I would say by the end of the day, sorry, Tony's uh, kids are involved. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word! Oh, you straight over a line there, on. Yep. Jesus Christ! I would say by the end of the day, <laughs> that's stuff, far enough. That's not the, far enough. That's the type of stuff that like Khabib took very personally. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good point. That's a very good point. You know, I mean, like you, can, warfare, you can say, yeah? you can say, as as Tony batters, you can say, it's just business, Tony. It's just business. <laughs> it's just business, Tony. <laughs> Maybe like, yeah, shut up now, on or whatever. <laughs> Can I Sh shut up now, Owen. <laughs> right, chief of the trash talkers over there. Get right. 
Orphan Schmorphin. Right, there's the poster. I would totally fight this guy. I'm calling him out right now. Owen Sheehan with uh, the, uh, the wrong EA. Has anyone actually contacted the RDS and asked for uh, no, we'll get availability? Somewhere. We'll get somewhere. Time for the uh, newspapers. OTB AM. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a dedicated call centre. All right, let's run you through the newspapers uh, very quickly before we get to our breakfast menu this morning. Um, Gavin Comiskey's piece with uh, Gordon Darcy in the Irish Times today is very good. Uh, is Ireland's system dependent on one person? Is it dependent on one person? Darcy didn't answer the question. We'll get into some more detail on this in a couple of minutes' time, but I mean, there's kind of a sense that yes, yes it is. <laughs> yes, it's entirely dependent on, on uh, Joe Schmidt. There's also a, uh, an interview with Conor O'Shea, and then uh, a lot of stuff around the football from last night and the future of the international rules. There might be a possibility of an uh, Ireland-Australia test in New York. The examiner this morning is a picture of the ticket from the day that uh, the All Blacks were beaten by Munster. Munster beat the All Blacks in the game? I never heard anything about that. They never mention it. No, no I, don't think, I don't think that happened. Uh, I, think so that, I think that's fake. Uh, 1978, 40 years on from the making of Munster Rugby, Donal Lennon relives the magic and challenges the myths of 1978. And that's a picture of, um, it's signed by a bunch of the players. One, two, three, four, five or six of the players anyway have signed it. And then Trick or Treat, there's a, I said there's a different one there. McGrath Furlong bring Lions experience wires from, uh, this is a changed and updated version. Trick or Treat, Hanson's Irish trick fears may come true as Murray could face the All Blacks. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes' time as well, because it's on the back of the Irish Independent this morning as well. Ireland not ruling Murray out of clash with All Blacks. This is the notion that perhaps, maybe, Conor Murray could make his return for uh, Ireland on the 17th of November against the All Blacks and not play a minute of rugby beforehand. FAI and IFA set to co-host European Under-21 Championship is the headline in Dan McDonald's piece, or at least they're going to bid for it anyway. Um, they're trying to bring the Under-21 European Championships to the island in 2021 or 2023 as a precursor to the uh, Five Nations hosting the uh, World Cup proper in 2030, which, I mean, let's face it, why shouldn't we try and host a World Cup? Brexit might be a bit of an issue. Free, free passage of players, people through. Maybe that'll be the end of the Brexit nightmare, will be the flowering, a, a new stage in international relations between these islands when we host the World Cup in 2030. Co-hosting with it? the Scots and the Welsh. And, and England. And England. So four teams automatically qualifying for the Five. World Cup. Five. Northern Ireland. It's, um, well, it's like a 60-team World Cup. Who knows, by then, there may be one Ireland. I mean, maybe, yeah. Anything could happen over Call the next Northern Ireland, it? 10 to 15 <laughs> years. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. I don't know. Let's not go down the hall. We should be hosting the World Cup. Back page, the Irish... Sorry, Dave. Uh, it's the same story, basically, on the back page of the Irish Daily Mail this morning. Joining Forces reads the headline, uh, FAI and IFA to unite in bid to host under-21 Euros and uh, Chicago Hope. Car be ready to seize chance at Soldier Field. Uh, back page of the start in this morning is going with an exclusive on Declan Rice. No more Mr. Rice guy, they say. Declan's set to choose England. Some interesting stuff on that, which we'll get to in just a moment. While the back page of the Sun says, Double your dosh, Potch. Real in £17 million a year bid to lure Spurs' boss and uh, an upper deck setback, says uh, the son here, that uh, are, as Ireland continue to wait on whether they get a second chance with Declan Rice, the player is glad to have taken his at uh, West Ham this season. So uh, he's in positive form, but uh, it seems that he's going to be in even more positive form after he chooses uh, England in the next couple of weeks because Gareth Southgate has met with him and pre presented him with uh, a, a range of statistics showing why he could be an integral part of England in the coming years. Back page of the mirror then is threats son, stun Zaha. Uh, so Wilfred Zaha yesterday on Instagram posted, for all the people taking it one step further and being racist and wishing death on my family, I wish your family is the best too. X. P.S. My life is still very good despite your hate with a little champagne emoji. He was uh, racially abused online uh, after that uh, Arsenal match at the weekend where... Made the most of a penalty, but it was a penalty. Even Granite Jack has said after the game, it was a penalty. Um, so pretty disgusting behaviour from what I can only assume are Arsenal fans targeting uh, Wilfred Zaha online. Uh, front page of the Daily Telegraph sports section. 
is Jones rolls the dice. Brown dropped for the first time. Ashton set to end four-year exile and Toje in line for back row switch. So big news coming uh, from uh, Eddie Jones and the England camp ahead of the November internationals. And then uh, they go with that story as well on the back page of The Guardian. But the picture here is, I was frustrated. It dragged me down. Thomas reveals tensions with Team Sky over whom Donald McRae has spoken to him. His new book is out. There's some interesting quotes now. We'll get to that uh, very shortly. Yeah, okay, we've got the UK back pages here. It's um, a bunch of them. W Dosh Potch is the uh, same one Zaha. Got death threats is the same. Uh, also, obviously, England dropped Brown from Test Squad. It's funny how dropping Brown is such a big story for English rugby, and yet it felt like it had been coming for a while, right? Yeah, well, he was forced to come out and defend him in the Six Nations earlier this year, wasn't he, when people were questioning whether we sh he should be playing. And then when he did turn out a really good performance, he went after the press again, saying, oh, you've all changed your tune, haven't you now, that you know, you're asked, asked me to leave him out. Now you're ta tell telling me how great a player he is. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, to yeah, Eddie Jones right. style, exactly. But Mike Brown, look, he's... He's definitely in the twilight of his career. He's 33 now. He's played 72 times for England. He's definitely not the player he was when he was the standout fullback in Europe five, four or five years ago when <coughs> Queens were going really well under Conor O'Shea. And, um, they do have better options. They have quicker options, and he isn't as durable as he once was either. He has shipped a few knocks, head knocks, picked up a few injuries along the way. Chris Ashton has been in brilliant form. And Eddie Jones isn't the kind of coach that's going to worry about some of the other antics you get when you pick Chris Ashton. No, he's going to encourage them. Yeah. Um, like, uh, if this goes tits up for England in this window, there's a good chance he gets fired. It's at that yeah. stage, right? Like, I, I, don't, I, w I, w I don't know what I would give percentage-wise of the chances of him not being the England head coach by Christmas, but like a disastrous November window? If How risky Boston, is it changing your head coach How risky in the final not, 12 months before a World Cup? How risky is it not changing? What are the alternatives? Who are the possibles when it comes to replacing Eddie Jones? The pressure that would be on the new guy coming in then? I don't know, but the slide has been inexorable. It's been in incredible to watch where they are now in comparison to where they were 12 months after he took the job, when all we wanted was an England All Blacks meeting. We haven't got that until this month. And now that they have it, and now that it's the kind of matchup everybody wants to see outside of Ireland, New Zealand, yeah. They might be uh, regretting actually putting that fixture on the fixture list by the end of it because there's a chance New Zealand will hammer them. And there's a good chance that the Springboks will hammer them as well because um, they've got a, a good coach who's picking their best players and the best players available to them and they've got a clear identity again. Uh, going to do be the Irish news and then there's one final uh, story from the papers here. Tiered championship could work if done right. McGrath, All-Ireland winner back at home club, Ross Trevor. So um, people are waking up to the whole prospect that maybe... The football championship isn't fit for purpose at inter-county level. We're going to talk about uh, football generally in a moment with uh, Casey O'Brien, the manager of St. Pat's in Wicklow. First, though, one last story from you. Yeah, it's interesting you mention that, actually. Paul Broderick's across uh, some of the newspapers as well this morning saying that the uh, second tier wouldn't work at all. But uh, back page of the Times Ireland edition this morning is injury could rule Kearney out of tests. And uh, that Ireland story again, they're set to host or set to uh, launch a bid to host the under 21 finals with the North. That's going to be announced tomorrow, we suspect. Yeah, and like obviously it's the two chief executives of the FAs, uh, the IFA and the FAI are making that joint announcement. So you would suspect they've done their back channeling across the corridors of power in European football and they're not coming tomorrow to go, oh, we've got like a 30% chance of winning this. Yeah, a lot of the talking would have been done at this stage. A lot of the diplomacy would have been worked through at this stage. <clears throat> I think it would be great. I think we've already shown with the Women's World Cup, for example, uh, in the rugby that you know, we do take to these kind of tournaments, and what, even if they are a lot smaller in scale than, say, the big deals like a Rugby World Cup or, or a Football World Cup or Olympic Games, which is, as we know, touted <laughs> not so long ago. But um, it would be a great way to get our 21s into a major tournament. There's one other story that's um, coming out this morning, and that is the news that uh, Sky and BT have agreed a deal. So Sky will be the official exclusive carrier of BT Sport. Um, so if you want to get BT Sport next summer, from next summer on, you're going to have to use the Sky platform. Um, so uh, this follows on the back of a deal in the UK. BT has also agreed to act as a billing agent and to sell Now TV on Sky's behalf. So there's obviously loads of stuff going on where they're cross-pollinating each other. Sky recently uh, announced you can get Netflix on their platform so you don't have to switch from... You stay in their wall garden, you yeah. still continue to use Netflix and YouTube. Don't have to get the phone out. Yeah. 
So, um, obviously, it's part of the air bundle at the moment, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with, uh, with that. And this was something they confirmed in the UK last year, and I, I just wonder what it means when it comes to <clears throat> the battlegrounds for Premier League rights in the years to come. Mm. Are, is there some cooperation going on here, some coordination of bids, or are they putting up a Chinese wall of some description when it comes to buying rights for both rugby and football and keeping that completely separate to this sort of an arrangement. Well, that's true. It's actually interesting to say that because is this going in the opposite direction if you take your logic one step further of what we thought at the start of the season where you'd have like six or seven different platforms, whereas now it's kind of going back to maybe more of a monopoly, which, you know, monopolies are never good things. But given like the, the advent of 11 sports and all that sort of stuff, I'm starting to think actually paying just for <coughs> one subscription isn't that necessarily a bad thing. But obviously, obviously you're going to have Amazon in the in the frame for the next um, for the next Premier League right deal. Yeah, or not? Maybe Amazon decided that they they like had their dipped their toes in the water and it's too competitive and they don't want it and they're not selling your broadband. Like so, it's not quite the loss maker reason to get people hooked in that Amazon, unless, unless Amazon start giving me a broadband too, who knows. Anyway, that was a, a bit of a diversion, we'll get back to that um, a little bit later on when some more details emerge about whether or not you're actually going to have to pay or if it comes as part of a standard package or what you get, so uh, it'll have to be happening next summer anyway, so you've got a little, bit of, a little bit of time before that happens. Let's move on to one of the big stories over the last uh, few days or so, the um, amazing scenes in Wicklow when uh, St. Pat's, uh, St. Patrick's won the county championship a massive achievement for the club and then immediately had to turn around and 24 hours later go and uh, play in the Leinster Club Championship. Their manager Casey O'Brien joins us on the line now. Casey, first off, I guess I should start by saying congratulations because, you know, a lot of people probably don't know that much about Wicklow County football or club football, but it was an amazing achievement for you guys to uh, to beat Rathnew. Yeah, how's it going, lads? Um, yeah, look, at it was, uh, you know, Pats and Rathnew were... Uh, we, we're all in the one parish down here, you know, and uh, they've been great champions over the years. And um, you know, we hadn't won it in six years, and um, it was just great to get, you know, to, to, to beat them in the final. You know, it was a it meant a lot to the people in the town. You know, was it a close game? Yeah, well, we drew the first day. Uh, we got a point in injury time to, to our full back went up the field and got a point in injury time to, to force a replay, and then. Um, yeah, we were seven three down with fourteen minutes to go, and we we won ten eight. We finished very very strong. Yeah, so a very very tight game. Yeah. Okay, so like undoubtedly one of the crowning achievements for the club, and uh, a great opportunity for that club within the town to you know have one over on your your nearest uh, local rivals. An amazing achievement that you would, I guess, have liked to have been able to celebrate properly. Yeah, well. You know, as I say, we we, we weren't going to stop the guys having a having a drink that night. You know, some of them drank a lot, some of them drank a few. You know, but um, overall, we, we we still knew that we um, we did be the Leinster Championship game the next day, and we all met for breakfast at nine o'clock in the morning. Then we had to go up and get with three masseuses in to give them rubs, and then we went on to play the match in Auckland, which was a half on as well. So it was even twenty one hours. We had two matches to play. You know, and. Um, no, it was a uh, probably took a little bit off the ice on on on, on Saturday night, you know, and knowing that we had it, we had the match the next day. And like, I don't know. At some point, at any point, did you guys and Rathnew think about coming together in advance of it to try collectively to get the game changed? Yeah, you know, to be fair, the county board sent in emails to try and get it changed, you know, but it was never. It, for whatever reason, it wasn't changed. You know, um, but the, th- the thing about going into it was um, we couldn't look any further than Ratnew, and Ratnew could probably look no further than us. Like so, you know, to be fair, the players were whoever won it were kind of underdone because we had done no homework on on road. Like we for the whole championship, we done our homework on all the teams and we go that we were playing against. And we absolutely knew nothing about road because we just couldn't look any further than Ratnew. So the players were kind of you know, a little bit robbed as well because we couldn't do our job. Yeah. You know, to, you know, to, to, uh, to tell them about roads, you know what I mean? And, and, and the freshness and everything had gone. We, we, we weren't a fresh team on, on Saturday. Um, I think if the roads, I'm not saying we'd beat road, you know, they beat us by 10 points, but we feel if road had to play right now on Saturday, 
they could probably beat in road on Sunday. You can't be, you don't beat, you don't play a team like Grant New and refresh the next day. I mean, it was only 10 months ago that they beat St. Vincent's down, to, down in Ockram in the Lens of Championship. You know? Yeah, so, they're a really good side. Yeah, really good side. It's just impossible, it's impossible. And the way teams are, are fit this year, or, or, or the way even club teams are so fit, fit and, and strong, you know, you need to be fresh when you're playing a team in a team like Road. Casey, there was a, a, a suggestion yesterday that the Leinster Council were punishing the Wicklow County Board for not getting their fixtures uh, <coughs> cycled through in time and that ultimately it was the Wicklow County Board's responsibility. They fought back yesterday with a statement saying Wicklow's a dual county, hurling and football has to be played week on, week off. We had our, our championship planned. We got our league completed early at the behest of the clubs. We had our county players available for all the league matches. That this was actually a pretty good year from uh, a Wicklow fixtures perspective, but that there was no flexibility from the uh, Leinster fixtures fixing. What's your take on that whole matter? Does the county board bear some of the responsibility? Did the Leinster Council bear some of the responsibility? How did this happen? Well, to be honest, like... Uh um, Mick Hagen and, and Tom Warren have been doing the fixtures in the county for, for a long, long number of years. And for whatever reason this year, um, two Le- Leinster representatives came in, stepped in and decided to take over fixtures in Wicklow. And they've done some good things. As I say, we're, we're not going, we're not travelling over to West Wicklow now in, in November, December and Sunday morning finishing off leagues or what have you. Um, but they were set in stone and there was no, there was nothing they obviously didn't look at the at when the Leinster dates were were, were were going to be on in both football and hurling. Like I mean, if Carlo and Glenelly had a draw last week in the hurl, they were in the same boat next week. You know what I mean? There was no no leeway given for replays or anything like that, and there wasn't a championship hurling ball or football struck for the whole year until the fourteenth of July, from junior B level to senior level in both codes. Now, how can you cram in from junior B level to senior level in both codes from the 14th of July, you know, to, 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 to October? You're, you're going to run into trouble, and that's 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 exactly what happened. Like, But as I, I can't put the whole blame on Wicklow County Board because they got these two guys in to to, uh, to oversee the fixtures, and, 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 and that's what happened. Would you recommend next year, if you were going back, kind of taking the lessons from this year, that some championship matches get played in April? Like, is a split championship season something that you as a manager would uh, complain about? Or actually think, okay, well, if it means that we have two weeks to prepare for the county champions to prepare for the Leinster Championship, then fair enough, we all have to to do what's best for Wicklow football. Yes, there is a lot of dual players in, in, in Wicklow. You know, there, there definitely is. But we've just seen a hurling championship there with were six teams in it this year and it was around Robin. And they all played each other, but nobody went out of it. No you know, nobody actually went out of it. After the round Robin, the six six teams were still were still intact and they had the quarter finals, the semi finals and final. Now, I mean, if if surely to God they could have played probably two rounds of that in April, which 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 would which would help later on, if you, if you understand me. Yeah. Intermediate hurling was the same. It was around Robin, but nobody went out of it. And, and I mean, the football championship then was around Robin, but, but uh, there were six teams in each group. But only the top three got out. The bottom three were gone. You know, so they were me- they're meaningful games. I'm not, I'm not dismissing the, the hurling championship under no circumstances, but, you know, it would have helped to play a couple of those games in April, you know, to, which everybody knows at the end of the season. Oakland, Ely and Alien Ratney were going to be into business end of it, and they have been for the last thirty years, you know. And they've a lot of players playing for both clubs, you know. So we are everybody knows what's coming down the line. Ratney and Ely will be in a semi final or final at the end of the year, you know. And there was no allowances made for that. Casey Wicklow were knocked out of the football championship on the 9th of June. Yeah. Dublin were knocked out. Well, they were knocked out, but they completed their football championship on the second of September, and yet. Despite, for all intents and purposes, both counties, when it comes to the club game, being dual counties, and they have a similar number of matches to run off, Dublin more so because they have more clubs, 
the county championship in hurling in Wicklow and football in Dublin finished on the same weekend. I don't understand that. And you mentioned 14th of July as being the date that the hurling championship at senior level in Wicklow started. Why was there a gap of almost five weeks between Wicklow's exit in the football championship to the opening round of the hurling championship at club level in Wicklow? What, can you explain why there was such a gap? Oh, I can't really. I, I what was, so what was happening on the on the club scene in that five-week well, period? Finished, they finished a couple of um, league games in, in, in the football, you know, the Dunn Cup and things like that. But, um, I, I, yeah, I, I have no answer. I, I, I don't understand why you were waiting another five, six weeks for um, for the championship to, to, to kick off. They, they, that were the dates that they put out at the start of the year and the... Uh, these lengths of people come down and put them out and stuck to it. Um, we started we started training on the 6th of February. Our, our, our team, you know, 6th of February to to the end of October, like, you know, it's, it's crazy. Were there no questions, Casey, raised within the county when you, when the full-time whistle is gone in that game against Clare and Ockram, are there no questions being raised the following Monday morning that, as to why we now have a six-week wait for the championship to begin? Because this was entirely avoidable. Whether the blame is with the county board or the blame is with, or some of the blame on the shoulders of these two Leinster representatives, this is a farcical situation that you have an already creaking club championship system in a county that is, as I've said, a dual county when it comes to the club scene, and yet there is nothing happening at the height of the summer in brilliant weather when all anybody wants to do is get out and play championship hurling, and there isn't a single game being played, and at the end of it, you are being asked to play twice in 21 hours. Like, if it wasn't so um, demeaning to the players and coaches involved, it would be laughable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely crazy. Like, you know, whatever they're talking about, league, right, getting the league out of the way and all. But at the end of the day, you know, the pinnacle of all players um, that, that, that play Gaelic football are all in this championship. You know what I mean? And I, I could see it coming. I say, I could, you know, everyone could see it coming. It was set in stone, and there was not no, nothing changed. Nothing started earlier, and it was set in stone. And we knew, we knew that the, uh, all it took was one draw to put the whole lot. Were you playing challenge matches during that six weeks, Casey? Yeah, we played a couple of challenge. We did, we did, we did done cup for um, the top four in the league played off. So we we, we three done cup matches, but we also went and we played a couple of challenge matches. We played a toy. We played a couple of teams in Dublin. In the build up to in the build up to the championship. On weeks when the club championship should have been played? Yes. I mean, what else can you say? Yeah. Yeah. It, and would you agree, Casey, that there's we can sp we can get all the stakeholders in the same room, the CPA, the GPA, the GAA, <clears throat> get everybody talking about putting this master fixture list in place, which is something the CPA have been talking about for a year. The GPA had it in their statement that they released last week. But no matter how much time these people spend in the same room. If a county that's knocked out of the championship on the 9th of June can't get their championship run off by the end of October, there is no structural change that anybody, the brightest minds in the country, can put in yeah. place that will stop this happening. Would you agree with that? I, I, I totally agree. Would you look at, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're, we, we, I, I, look, when, 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 when would our championships have been played if, uh, if our Holland and football teams went on for uh, another month? You know, um, or two months, so we, we we wouldn't get it finished till bloody St. Stephen's Day, you know. Um, abso absolutely, I, I just think it's crazy. It shouldn't happen, and it boils down to you say you can put people into a room and you can just put it. At the end of the day, boils down to common sense. Casey, we leave it there. Good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Okay, thank you, lads. Congratulations on the uh, championship win. Thanks a million. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Casey Bryan, the manager of um, St. Patrick's, the Wicklow County champions, obviously he went straight out of the um, Leinster Championship. It's a, bit, it's a bit mad that they can't fix this stuff. But it's... <laughs> I was unaware of the, the specifics to the dates until Casey came on with us there. Um, one last thing, the, a notion that um, <coughs> Wicklow are being punished for being slow and getting their stuff done. Who's actually being punished? The players from the county champions. Yeah. Not the Wicklow County Board, because they're not getting fined. They're not getting. There's no like reprimand for them, really. It's like the public shame, which Irish people don't feel. It's like it's that club who are the county champions, the players, the administrators, the coaches, 
the volunteers of that club are, are the ones getting punished. If that if that was the motivation behind it, which um, was being suggested in some quarters yesterday. Well, if you're not being punished, if you know weeks, if not months in advance, when that fixture is going to take place, that's not you haven't been punished. You're the the insinuation is that they've been punished after the fact. But that game by against Rome was in the fixture list. By not moving it back a week. Because well, it's it not. I don't think it's down to the Leinster Council unless there's a huge number of unforeseen events or a set of circumstances there like one, there was one know, draw. Like Leinster there's one draw, or like maybe we get well. you know weather that we've never seen during the summer and a deluge of rain that may, may renders pitches across up and down Wicklow unplayable, and there are three or four consecutive weeks lost. Like the GA did lose earlier this year with the snow and the storms, and it meant the O'Byrne Cup final was played in April, for example. It was even May, but the one that Mead was involved in. Then maybe a little bit of leeway. But that game, that opening round of the Leinster Football Championship was set in stone since June. The Wicklow County Board and or these two Leinster representatives that Casey has uh, talked about, they knew exactly what was coming down the track. There was a six-week window in which to at least begin the championship. That was just thrown into the, the bin. And I cannot, for the like of me, understand how a county like Wicklow finished their hurling championship a week after the Dublin Senior Hurling Championship is completed. All right, let's move on. We bring you the uh, AM breakfast menu this morning. We've got lots to talk about. Six points for you. Doping in uh, rugby. It's actually um, South African rugby. Uh, Gerant Thomas versus Chris Froome. Um, maybe the lid has been lifted on one of the most explosive. Is it? Who cares? I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to care about the, uh, you know, the Sky Boys fighting each other. But anyway, we'll try. Oh, one's going to uh, make you salivate about that one. The second tier and whether or not it could work uh, in a football championship. We need to move away. The branding of this is already bad when you're calling it second tier. Joe Schmidt's next move, and we're going to start with Declan Rice. Um, the tab of the morning to you? Yeah, no more Mr. Rice guy. It's really good. Uh, the star obviously being kind of leading the way in this story. Paul Lennon's had previously said that Declan Rice was still very much available, still very much up for grabs uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, which he kind of points out in his piece. It's a joint byline with Ian Mert uh, uh, in the Irish Daily Star. They say it's an exclusive, uh, which it is. There is a rice story in the Sun this morning, but it's just about his club form. But uh, in terms of the Irish stuff, uh, he's expected to confirm his pitch of allegiance after uh, the games against Northern Ireland and Denmark. Uh, so he was invited to St. George's Park earlier this month, Declan Rice was, and uh, at his second meeting that was with Southgate in five months, Rice was presented with a range of statistical data showing how he could fit into the England setup. So Gareth Southgate came prepared to his meeting with Declan uh, Rice. He said the teenager was assured that if he did commit to England, he would become a key member of the squad once his FIFA international transfer had been completed. Now Martin O'Neill had obviously uh, also spoken to Declan Rice, but he's been speaking to him as recently uh, as the past fortnight, and it's believed uh, that he did not commit to a return to the Ireland squad after that conversation. And last night, uh, an FAI spokesman stated that there has been no approach by Rice or the FA to the FAI to start the lengthy international transfer process, but it seems that it's a matter of if rather than when that's going to happen. When rather than if that's going to happen. Yes, that's what I meant. Um, how lengthy is the lengthy process? Months? Not like two years, right? Months, I think, yeah. Yeah, so it's not that lengthy. Uh, no, it, it, like, he'll be, he'll, be, he'll be good to go for the actual qualifiers for, for the Euros, I would imagine, when it comes to England. Like, we've all seen this coming. It is interesting that Gareth Southgate has taken it as his pet project to go and actually get after Declan Rice. It just shows uh, how highly he's viewed over there and the potential with which they see him over uh, at St George's Park and not just here in Abbottstown. You think about, like, he's sitting at home not on any international duty, he's watching the games back to back and it's like England's amazing performance against Spain or any of the Ireland games, any five minutes of the Ireland match, any clip on Twitter or social media, it seems like, uh, 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 I'm just going to go over here and hang out with my new friends. The connection that the England team seems to have with its fans at the moment, with the press at the moment, how loved the manager seems to be at the moment. And um, you go to the the home of the Spaniards, a place in Sevilla, in Sevilla where they do not lose. No. And have never been in a position where they're losing games. I remember going all the way back to the qualifiers for World Cup 90. We went oh, to yeah. Sevilla and drew nil-nil and was heralded as the most unbelievable result because Spain, when they play in Seville, never lose. And um, that I was actually commentating on the Tottenham PSV game last week. Eric Dyer was playing for Tottenham. He's the guy I most associate with um, being the fall guy to a Declan Rice inclusion in any England team. And there's no comparison between the two of them already, I'm talking. 
I'm not talking about Declan Rice when he's Eric Dyer's age because there's a five year gap between them. I'm talking now. I would have Declan Rice in my team ahead of Eric Dyer every time. What about that tackle against Sergio Ramos? The, the, the Eric Dyer marker that he laid down, which despite the fact that they beat the, uh, Spain and they scored three goals, the fact that the tackle was the most memorable thing that game says a lot. I'm not, well, I'm not saying it makes Derek Dyer any less of a player than he currently is. And he does bring certain qualities. But there's no reason why um, Declan Rice couldn't smash into Sergio Ramos sure and lay down a very similar marker if necessary. Look, we're talking about it because it's in the papers this morning, but we know in our heart of hearts and everybody associated with Irish football, they know that this is a done deal. Yeah, so and it has been since the first time it got mooted. Yeah. You don't go public with the I'm not in love with you anymore story unless it's over. And this is just a long, slow, steady death by a thousand cuts that was utterly predictable. It was the uh, qualifiers for 92 that we drew nil all with. 92, they, was they it? They hammered us 2 0. Like it was a proper 2 0 run around in the World Cup qualifiers in, uh, for 1990. We recovered from that. Didn't recover from. No, it couldn't be 92. 92. They weren't in our group in 92. In, for the qualifiers? That group we had England, Poland, Turkey. No, Spain. Spain nil, Republic of Ireland nil, World Cup qualifier, 18th of November, 92. Sorry, for the 94 World 94 Cup. 94 World Cup. Yeah, 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 but it was in 92. Good point. Um, okay, so the next point we're going to talk about is um, Joe Schmidt's next move. Uh, Gordon Darcy's piece today. He's kind of asking, are we, are we a one-man system? Are we a one-man process here? <clears throat> or we're a, a one-system process, maybe? That is the system more important than the actual head coach in charge? That's not what he's asking, but that's what... I'm taking from it that if you just took somebody who was as regimented as Joe Schmidt and put him into a system that Joe Schmidt's already set up, how successful would Ireland be? And I think it's a valid question. But uh, the fact of the matter is Joe Schmidt's an outstanding coach and there's obviously going to be some sort of drop-off. It feels like there's a tug-of-war going on at the moment. That I don't know if a decision's been made. I don't know if Schmidt's made up his mind that he, he definitely, this is it now, there's a... A limit here and there's going to be an automatic move to the southern hemisphere <coughs> I think that like there's definite attractions to being the single most important person in Irish rugby history and like, Brendan Fanning's piece of the weekend saying oh the mood music points in one direction one direction only and that's like going back to New Zealand I don't really I mean he he has obviously way better rugby sources than most people in the world but I can't see that. I don't. I don't see that publicly yet. Yeah. Uh, the mood, mood music that Brennan Fanning is listening to, <clears throat> as you say, is probably very different to the mood music, mood music that we're listening to. I haven't heard any of those melodies. But there's, when Gordon Darcy talks about the assist of the Irish system, like there's two systems. One is the Irish rugby system, which is really got very little to do with Joe Schmidt. After he's gone, that system will continue to churn out the superstar potential that it currently is. And if anything, you would hope, and Darcy mentioned this in his piece, that Connacht, Ulster and Munster will move on down the road and that will actually make Irish rugby even stronger, that they will eventually get somewhere close to the level that Leinster are currently at in terms of that conveyor belt of talent that's in chain at the moment. Then the other system is the Irish 15 that play under Joe Schmidt whenever a team is picked. And we'll only know how important he is to that system when he's gone. I, there's no way really to put your finger on the impact of a Joe Schmidtless Irish setup when it comes to us winning matches. Unless you look at Leinster with Joe Schmidt and Leinster with Matt O'Connor and go, ooh, if you, if, you, if you screw it up, if you get the decision wrong, then the fall off <laughs> is precipitous. But it is possible to make a recovery. That, you know, so there needs to be succession planning. And it looks like Andy Farrell is the natural successor at the moment. Or Stuart Lancaster. Yeah. Which, I don't want to be too disrespectful to Matt O'Connor because he did win a Pro 12 and did get them to a Heineken Cup semi-final and they were only beaten by the width of a post when Jimmy Goppert missed a drop goal in Toulon. Or away to Toulon. It was in, it was in the south of France. I think it was Marseille. So he wasn't a million miles away from achieving great things at Leinster. But yes, when you compare him and his CV to Joe Schmidt or to Stuart Lancaster, they're there is a difference. I think the impact of Schmidt leaving now, leaving Ireland in comparison to when Schmidt left Leinster would be less keenly felt. Because Lancaster's in the system. There, just are, there are pieces in place that weren't in place back then. You're also talking about a Leinster minus Johnny Sexton. 
which would not be the case in this situation when it comes to Ireland. And you're also talking about that time in Irish rugby and European rugby. It was in a state of flux. The Heineken Cup was about to be dismantled and it was about to be replaced by what it is now. And the English and French clubs were just entering this period of domination, Toulon in particular, where they had assembled all of their um, Galacticos. They were just all at the right age, whereas we've seen how much they've dropped off now. All these guys have either stepped away or are still there but are, are well past their best. I think the landscape is very different now to compare to what it was when Schmidt walked away from Leinster. So I would hope that if, if he was to choose to leave after Japan, that we would be in a position to survive, survive it. And, and do as well as we're doing. Well, well, look, who knows? Who knows? It's hard to see us doing as well immediately. Because how do you follow that? Particularly if it's on the back of a World Cup semi-final, a final, or a world title. Like, I mean, how do you follow that? It's very unlikely it's going to be a world title, right? Like, it's, it's unlikely, but it's... The most likely outcome is that we... are the best can... position than we, that we've ever been. We're, always, something we're like always in the best position we've ever been. We we're really always. are now. <laughs> And look, the personal situation that Joe Schmidt is in as well, like, maybe Brendan would have more of an insight to, into that than we do, but like, we know that he's happy in Ireland. We know that his family is happy in Ireland. And that is something that he will have to think long and hard about to you, up sticks. Are you ever going to professionally have the setup that you have available to you now? That you can just pick up the phone to any one of the four head coaches that essentially come under your remit and say, I don't want him to play next week. Or if he is playing, I want him to have this number shirt on his back. Yeah, the only other job in the world he can do that in is the All Blacks job, yeah. where it's kind of, everybody understands what, and where the top of the tree is. I was is. talking to a New Zealander at the weekend, sorry. Um, he's a producer in rugby at the weekend, and he said that Schmidt wouldn't even be in their top two at the moment. Who is the top two? I can't remember. <laughs> the Crusaders. The, uh, I can't remember the names that they gave. That he's he got to bite his time down there. He's um, got service. But time. they are, they are, they are head coaches in Super Rugby at the moment. The two guys that he was talking about. But Gatland and Schmidt aren't in the top two, according to him, at least. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that going on to try and, you know, well, he he needs to want us. Just well, there seems case. to be a feeling that he needs to spend time in Super Rugby before he's just automatically given the All Blacks job. I mean, yeah, because he can't watch tape. He can't watch, oh, that guy's good, that guy's good, that guy's also good, that guy's not so good. He can't do that from watching tape. Do you want to be the guy that follows the three in a row as well? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I probably do. I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. I think that like the Ireland job is a perfect situation of... a perfect confluence of power, access control of players and opportunity on a personal level. I think it's like this perfect situation. But what's so the, the opportunity on a personal level? What's the end game of that opportunity? Like I would have always you thought that the All Blacks coach the was the end game. But maybe maybe it's not. Maybe like we view this in a way that other people don't. Like uh, the constant, constant criticism that he would receive from... Um, being criticised quite a bit at certainly early days in Ireland. Almost none compared to the level of criticism he would face on a daily basis. This, we're talking like the Real Madrid manager. We're talking the England manager Living in the in darkest days. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's exactly. the level There's, of scrutiny you're under. And people still want those jobs. Uh, yeah, but they're all getting paid like 14 million a year. Like, that's not what... It'll, it'll be a pay cut to go home as well. So um, the second tier, I think the marketing around this is not great, so um, what's this Broderick second tier story? Well, Bro Paul Broderick doesn't like the idea of it because there has been, I don't want to say a lot of support for it over the last couple of weeks, but there's certainly been a clamour to try and move things in a direction where we're actually starting to say to ourselves, actually, people want this to happen, uh, when initially it seemed that people didn't want this to happen. So he was asked, he's been, he's around the papers this morning, I'm just going to read from the mirror, he says... Explain who he is. Uh, Paul Broderick, uh, Carlo Corner Forward, nominated for uh, an All-Star. Uh, if you ask me, would I like to play in a second-tier championship, the answer would be no. But if you ask me, do I think we're going to win the All-Ireland in the A, the answer is no as well. Uh, I know it's one in 65 years, but what the likes of Carlo beating Kildare has done for Carlo football, we mightn't re reap the awards of what that has done if things change. Um, the best guiding light, he says, for people is probably uh, experience, and having experienced the very bottom rung of Division 4 and losing heavily to teams for years, there's no experience like that to let you know where you are. He says, it feels like you're maybe being ushered off to make way for those greater teams on the greater stage. It takes away that chance that day that we had against Kildare. But yeah, you're right in that one. So um, it's, it is the sort of uh, conflict between the one-off miracle that you can get from everybody being in 
the one championship. Like I don't want to call Carlo Vitti Calera a miracle because it wasn't a miracle. Uh, it was a. It was I mean, a, it was. It was a surprise. It was a miracle. It, it was like just they just been promoted for the first time in 33 years. This was the best Carlo team in decades, so it wasn't uh, an overly big shock. Calera like 15 wides and missed a penalty. Yeah, still nearly. Carlo didn't kick a single wide, and nearly, and still nearly. Leave that in itself the is miraculous. Come on, I was, at, I was at that game. Carlo were the better team; they deserved to win that game, uh, without question. Um, On the day, but they're not the better team. No, but I did say it's a surprise. It wasn't like a massive miracle. But anyway, uh, the idea that this, um, like, the, it is as I say, that conflict between these results that are unusual and uh, results that are more usual because that's what you're going to get with a, a two-tier championship and uh, he says it's small-minded thinking that uh, the proposal is uh, it, it would be good to bring in a two-tier championship um, which goes against obviously the, the GPA's findings last week that 60% of people would support a tier championship um, There yeah, is a mechanism by which teams like Carlo can still have their crack off Kildare and then take part in a we close proposal was that. Exactly. Um, so I don't think um, the likes of Paul Broderick is correct in saying that we'll just never get an opportunity for the, to experience those kind of highs again. And the other part of it is that I said it on the show with Owen and Adrian last Friday, I don't think the current players are the players that need to be asked about this. No, it's the 12 and 14 year olds exactly. and 16 year olds who are going to ruin their lives trying to play football. Exactly. For their county like, there's no stuff, way a current Carroll footballer or a current lead from football or a Wicklow footballer is going to offer a B Championship. But maybe the Wicklow footballers in 10 years' time might fancy it. And here's the thing, it shouldn't be, I, I think that mechanism where everybody starts and then, and then you get spat out into the crappy stuff, like you have to start and earn the right to be in the good one, and yeah. which is how it's all sport an opportunity. works. And the other, like he says, it feels like we're just going to be ushered off to make way for the big dogs, but Carlo essentially, they were ushered off the, the, the stage by the end of June. And then the big dogs take over and the Super 8s kick in. So why not be playing football in June, July and August and playing a, bit, a final in Croke Park on the 2nd of September? Karen Cunningham has asked an interesting question on Twitter this morning. Good morning to you, Karen. How are you? Um, who was the last English-born player to declare for Ireland that would have played for England? It's been quite a while. England don't let Lawrence's or Townsend's go anymore. That's a good question. I can't recall a guy that England would have been clamouring for. Who at some point would have been capped. Like would Kilban have been capped at some stage? Yeah, I think probably. And he was called up to the 21s. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you look at the great players we had in the 80s, like would Johnny Aldridge eventually have Ah, yeah, top, by top scorer. Absolutely. If you, if they, did have, they didn't out to take Gary Lineker out of that squad and they didn't really have an outstanding nine. Yeah, so he's definitely... Definitely in squads. I think he's definitely contender for this discussion. Anyway. But after that, like the, the next generation, so who in that World Cup team? Somebody saying Gary Breen. Gary Breen have got in around that World Cup so. time. I mean... Well, he was linked with uh, Inter, Milan, Inter he was. But ha so that was after the World Cup in, in 02. Who did they have? They had Saul Campbell. They had Campbell, they had Rio Ferdinand coming through, John okay. Terry coming through. I don't think so. We get. love you, Gary, but I'm not sure you were going to get ahead of uh, one of those three and into the England eleven under Sven Sven Orin Eriksson. Probably gets a cap along the way. Oh yeah, caps. Know, but then his career is international has, career is ruined. Has ten, twelve games or as a sub or whatever, and like in you know in those November international window where there's no uh, where players are not showing up. Who else? Who else in that team that was English born? That in ninety in no two. Yeah, Matt Holland. Wouldn't, I don't think Matt would have got into the to an England team. Like again, maybe capped. I mean, you look at some of the guys who were capped in friendlies under Ericsson. Any of those guys we mentioned are as good, if not better, than those sort of fellas. But um, would they have had an England career? Per se, I don't think so. I, I hate to make a Jack Grealish comparison, but I wonder what he thinks of this idea that Gareth Southgate clearly sees Declan Rice as some sort of pet project now. Where it's like, I could develop into a better player than Declan Rice. Of course, different positions. We're not comparing I think, like, like I think that Jack Grealish, I think the character <coughs> of Declan Rice is like future England captain. Mm -hmm. I think the character of Jack Grealish is, uh, I'm going to be in a reality TV show in about five years. He's helped by the fact, though, that he's come in during the Southgate era, whereas Grealish made his decision much during the Hodgson era, where there was less of a sort of. Uh, Which you get him like far more brownie points, like when you were shit, I declared for you. Come on. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so our final few talking points here that we're going to rattle through before we get to some of our best of. Uh, Geraint Thomas 
versus Froome Dog. I right, just a, a quick hit on this. Uh, he's got a book out. He's done an interview with Donald McRae this morning, and he talks about his relationship with Chris Froome during the tour. Of course, there was no rivalry between him in, in the tour. Once he got ahead, uh, Froome was happy to support him, or so he thought. Uh, he says that before the team time trial, which happened on the second last day, third last day, yeah. uh, he was told he would be left by the other riders if he endured a puncture or a crash. Only Froome trailing Thomas by 52 seconds after two stages would be protected. Oh, sorry, this was early in the tour. Uh, Thomas sat there and stewed before saying, that's a bit shit, effing hell, guys. Can you really not wait for me? Uh, which uh, just obviously shows the favouritism towards Chris Froome. This is a, a bizarre one, he says. Uh, after the cobbles in Roubaix, they got to the hotel, and it was really hot in the hotel. But when they put the aircon units on for all eight riders, the electricity tripped. So they said, only one person can have it. Who do you think got the aircon? Garen Thomas? Nah, Chris Froome. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's a couple of other things in it as well, saying that uh, Arsene Wenger phoned him to congratulate him, and Thierry Henry sent him a, a video message to congratulate him as well. And he's met Lionel Messi in, in the last couple of months, so he's uh, rubbing shoulders with the, the best in the football world as well. But one final story we wanted to touch on is uh, an incredible story, which Martin Ziegler has kind of done up a piece around uh, in the Times Ireland edition this morning, and it is South African school rugby suffering rise in steroid use. So increasing positive tests for boys between 16 and 18, a big problem, says Ziegler. So basically the story here is that uh, anti-doping chiefs in South Africa uh, have expressed alarm at evidence that coaches and parents are complicit in what appears to be the growing use of anabolic steroids by schoolboy rugby players. So there was drug tests done at this year's uh, Craven Week, which is kind of like the combine uh, for South African rugby. The, the national media is watching. There's kids, teenagers who are about to make a big... There's a lot on the line here, basically. We, we often have this conversation about why wouldn't you open? There's a huge incentive. Well, in Craven Week, there is a huge incentive. Uh, so there were six positive findings uh, for steroids. Each of the players had taken a cocktail of banned drugs and some of them had been injected by their parents. There is also evidence that drug taking by boys hoping to make it as professional begins when they are as young as 14 years of age. The chief executive of uh, the South African Institute for Drug Free Sport has been speaking about it and said, in one case, a boy's mother wrote an affidavit saying she injected the kid with ampules as she thought it was vitamin D. He also makes the very valid point here that it's the stupid doper that gets caught during Craven Week. So six people got caught during this week, six people who doped stupidly. So this is not, this is basically just scratching the surface on what actually goes on during this week. Uh, the tests showed that uh, the teenagers had all taken several different anabolic products such as nandrolone and testosterone and in some cases had taken the breast cancer drug tamoxifen to counteract the side effects of steroids which includes the development of breasts. And uh, as I say there, it's a, a big event, it's broadcast live, there's plenty of incentive to do it. Uh, six of them got popped this year but the fact that the parents are involved is grim. So this is what Philip Brown was talking about when he was talking about the different culture that Grant Grant Grabler had come from um, when he was talking about, oh, you know, like that's not something that we need to worry about in Irish rugby because that's a different culture. I presume that's what he's talking about because this culture <coughs> is rotten and we need to stop signing players from South Africa. That was the point I was going to make. There needs to be a, re a review uh, done of the Irish rugby policy of bringing South Africans into our games because, yes, the guy you're bringing in could be clean, but was he clean when he was 18? Was he clean when he was 16? That it's like that is rotten to the core that you've got parents involved in the doping of their own sons. That's pretty grim. Uh, we're going to get Darren in and run you through everything that's going on in the world of sport in a couple of minutes' time, but we are looking back at some of the best moments of the last 12 months because OTBAM is 12 months old today, uh, able to walk on our own now nearly to uh, feed ourselves and wipe our own arses. Not really, not yet. Here's the mountain um, <laughs> uh, talking about Conor McGregor. From Game of Thrones. It's on this screen here, I think, now. Yeah. Um, so he's, he's a little bit smaller than you. That's the bit where he's kind of... There, you. At this moment, I knew I could take him down, but I just didn't want to break him. Could you break him? I could. It feels that way, yeah? It, he felt very light. And there as well, you know, I, I, I had him a few times. There. But I just, I just didn't want to break him. He's quick on his feet. He's, he's quick, and he was very slippery as well, so it was hard to get a grip on him. But th there were at least two moments, I think, I could have just messed him. And is that hurting you when he's jabbing you in the torso? Not too bad, you know. There's a huge size difference, obviously, between me and him. Uh, There's a beautiful... Um, but I'm not used to getting punished, obviously. And I'm, I'm, I'm no fighter, so my technique is just like... Sh I'm, I'm wearing jeans and just some shoes on. I, I just took my shirt off and we were just joking. And, and he, he was just... 
He was just enjoy, in, enjoying himself to pen <laughs> some fucking big wood there. <laughs> there he's starting to punch you in the in the stomach, and that's yeah, like, yeah. I just I was I was just I wasn't ready for this, and I was obviously I'm a big guy. I was like, just fuck this. I'm not gonna run after <laughs> this small guy. He he's run he's 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 running around, you know. And that was a and, sneaky. Uh, and I, I I don't I don't I don't I don't have cardio for for running around after a small guy. So yeah. I just. I'm sneaking knee in the in the rib cage at the end there as well. Yeah. It seemed like he was taking that pretty seriously. He was. Yeah, he was. Like afterwards, when you extend a hand, he's like, "All right, okay, it's over now." Whereas before that, it was still game face on for Conor McGregor. I mean, bring me a shorts and put us in a in a cage, and you know, I'll fight you again. How long would it take for you to win? Uh, it would. If I would get a grab on him. 10 seconds. 10 seconds, okay. Yeah. And how many Conor McGregor's would it take to beat you? Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe five? Wow, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot, yeah. yeah. I, I'm sure uh, SBG could put up five uh, of uh, similar weight fighters uh, if, if you wanted to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> you could definitely get 100 million on pay-per-view if they're going to give it to Floyd Mayweather for, uh, for his fight. That'd be a better fight. Imagine, five of them. The Mountain versus McGregor. Or five McGregors. Five McGregors versus Mountain would be a great fight. It reminds me of the scene in Toy Story, Death by Monkeys, when the barrel opens and the dinosaur gets swallowed up by the monkeys. Five of them. I don't know. How could you survive getting digged in the kidneys, the ribs, the like hamstrings crush, at the same like time? <laughs> but these lad, the, the McGregors are too quick. He's a big eye unit. He's a massive man. The McGregors are too quick, as, as always. Tar- as Owen will find out when Tony had the kidney, <laughs> kidney punch in the first 10 seconds. Mm. No, Owen would be too quick. Of, uh, what it could potentially be when Owen and Tony come no. head to head. Tony doesn't land a shot because Owen is just too elusive. Pretty much. The man set to dominate the Bruiserweight division, Owen Sheen. Conor Murray could be set to for a sensational return in time to face New Zealand. The scrum half is yet to play this season due to a neck injury. The Munster man left out of Joe Schmidt's initial 42-man squad for the November internationals. He hasn't played since the summer he lined up for Ireland against Australia. But the Ireland's forwards coach, Simon Easterby, speaking yesterday, said Murray has not been ruled out of the All Blacks game just yet. It will come as little surprise to the New Zealand head coach, Steve Hansen, who refused to believe reports that he would miss the game and responded to questions about Murray in his best Irish accent. Uh, look, I'm not sure about that. I don't know uh, if Connor's really going to be out. Is it just an Irish trick, or is it for true? Um, look, Connor's a great player, and it's really disappointing uh, for both Ireland and us that he's not playing. You know, when you play uh, quality teams, you want all their players to be there. You know, because uh, it's called a test match because it. You know, for a reason, and, and it's about testing yourself. So, um, yeah, they'll miss him, but uh, what a wonderful opportunity for somebody else to step up and, and play well for Ireland, which I'm sure whoever that is that's given the opportunity will we'll do their best to do that. Meanwhile, Declan Rice has reportedly decided to pledge his international future to England. The star has the story today, which claims that the West Ham player will make an announcement that he's turned his back on the Republic of Ireland and switched allegiances to the three lines. In the coming weeks, Rice has represented Ireland at underage level. He's won three senior caps, two all in friendlies, unfortunately. They claim he met with England manager Gareth Southgate at St George's Park earlier this month, where he was assured that if he did commit to England, he would become a key member of their squad. Well, this email got football fans talking this week. The Announcement is believed to focus on the FAI set to launch a joint bid with the Northern Ireland Football Association to host the Under-21 European Championships. Ireland have never qualified for that tournament, but should they win the bid to host the event in 2021, they would qualify automatically with Northern Ireland as the host nation. The 2021 tournament would also coincide with the FAI centenary year. Noel King going to be still the manager? Yeah, apparently you, there's a, you can lose a whole lot of games at that age level and not qualify for many tournaments and... Still keep the you job get rewarded for by qualification. seven or eight years, yeah. It's a, a long time with the job. Meanwhile, FIFA have revealed that their IT system was hacked into earlier this year. The US Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigation have confirmed that this is the second time the data security of football's world governing body has been compromised. Russian military intelligence reportedly responsible for a separate hack in 2017 that led to the publication of a list of failed drugs tests by players. Reports suggest a number of outlets are working on stories taken from the stolen data that will centre on the transfers of Neymar and Kylian Mbappe. Oh. 
watch this space expected to drop over the next few days this second or third of November apparently when the stories will come to the fore. Well, Loris Karius took to Instagram to rubbish reports that Besiktas want to end his loan spell early and send him back to Liverpool. The 25-year-old German keeper penned a two-year loan deal. Hasn't really worked out well just yet. In nine games he has conceded 14 goals. He's kept just one clean sheet but he has described the reports as media BS as he sipped on his coffee on Instagram. It's definitely not BS though. If you're Besiktas, you're like, oh, come on. This guy's nowhere near as good as we thought. He looks like he's still concussed. Just get off the internet. Like, oh, yeah. w- when you're under so much pressure, why do you put up those kind of Instagram posts just inviting more stick, inviting more criticism? It's like in pre-season after he cost him the Champions League final. He has a video of him running around Santa Monica jogging with a shirt off to workout music. Yeah. I like, mean, it's the opposite of keeping a low profile. It is. There is a bit of like, yeah, even though I've cost my team the Champions League, I'm still in Santa Monica working out and look how hot I am. <laughs> There's probably there's probably part of you would be like, <laughs> what are you going to do, buddy? Sitting at your computer there somewhere in Liverpool or wherever it is. Well, it got him sent to Turkey by all accounts. Apparently Klopp didn't take too kindly to that video. And no, that, right, was that was the reason. Part of the decision, he decided to ship him off. Uh, ah, lads, add off the ball. Is this McGregor's pop and the young fillet from Kerry? Jesus, says Carl Murphy on Instagram. Yes, yes it is. That sums it up. <laughs> uh, hashtag Team Tony, original J Baby on IG. Is that a real person? Is that somebody we should know? You're an influencer, Ron. Yes, it is. Okay. Gareth A. Davis says, uh, Tony, I will corner. I'm on the way over for the first training camp interview on the water. I mean... Is he re- was that the real Gareth A. Davis? That is, yeah, yeah, on Instagram, yeah. Yeah, that's the real one. Uh, my coinage is on Tony, and then the emoji with the money for eyes and the green tongue. It says, round two KO. Would you last two rounds, Owen? Yeah, I would, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go two. There was a big editorial meeting here. There's one every morning. You know, there's a lot of radio stations in this building and they have a, a meeting every morning to decide what the agenda of the day is. And at that meeting was asked to the off-the-ball representative, is this a real thing? Is Owen really fighting Tony? Like, is this a real thing you're doing? And um, the answer was, we're not quite sure yet. Oh, it is a real thing, though. You've, you've asked me this about four times. I know, but I, I need, I need something with, I need something with conviction. Every time. Nobody it's, wants this to happen more than Darren Cleary. Yeah, it's a strange obsession you've got so much. Here. Imagine the money you could make. If McGregor Mayweather made, what, 200 million? Owen in the dark could definitely trouser a million. <laughs> I could hear the laughing, but Owen could make a million with the da. Why couldn't he? It's just, it's just like a really creepy sound off that. But, uh, yeah, let, let's go with us. Let's go so with much us. for doing it for charity, which was what was mentioned in the first part of the show. His, we can give it to charity too. It's Hugo Boss trousers, very tight. Trousering a million in that. Uh, pretend he handed you coinage, Tony, says Dara, 1986, also on Instagram. Oshin Langan, helpfully, f- adding fuel to the fire. Would Tony be okay if I paid for my ticket in small change? <laughs> and Carl Pendred, the real Carl Pendred, says, go on, Tony, Sinead O'Connor for the walkout. She's not called Sinead O'Connor anymore, of course. Um, but yeah, she could do walkout music. That'd be good, yeah. Book her. It would be a way for the McGregors to make up with the Muslim community to have her sing them out. Very true, actually, yeah, great point. You can make a bit of peace here, world peace, through fighting. Khabib's da. He's got, he's got to be in the mix there somewhere. That's the undercard. You could, you could get some help from him. I'd say the Khabibs would be interested in training on once... The Nurmagomedovs. The Khabibs. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping up with the Khabibs. There's a reality show in that. <laughs> we, uh, we're celebrating our one year on, uh, on air today. Are you like, finish your last story? That's me, yeah. Okay, good stuff. Uh, we learned about Tommy Walsh and his odd boots a little earlier in the summer as well. Have a look at this. Tommy Walsh flirted with an idea of... Uh, um, Wearing one boot of stud and one boot of Maldives. <laughs> As he would know, Tommy would do. I don't think it'll last it too long. Um, I remember asking him, like, why, which foot would you wear? And he said, I always turned on one foot, so that would always have the stud and the other was Maldives. So he, there was a bit of talk got into it. Good morning to you, Tommy Walsh. How you doing? Good morning, lads. Come on, tell us the story behind this. <laughs> well, you see, the whole idea, I was... It kind of started way back before then, Ger. Um, as a young fella, obviously, you wear whatever boot you get, whatever your parents buy for you. And sure, that time, it didn't really matter. There were long cogs, there were short cogs, whatever. And you wore them from, what, nine, ten years of age. So then I remember Liam Keown was obviously the county man in Tullerone that time. And it was a big thing when you're on the county panel. You got a new pair of Puma Kings, Maldies. And um, I remember, like, every year you'd probably get them. Or maybe that time it was forgetting to an all and final. So I remember he gave my father um, 
a pair that he had used. He must have got a new pair, and he gave him a, a pair that he was after using. And I used to go into the garden, obviously shooting that time, and uh, there was a field beside us. I was after getting a new goal post. I was after shifting it out. So I spent all the, the winter out there, but I used so that your sock, well, your socks probably got wet anyway, but instead of wearing wellies, which your parents were probably trying to get you to wear out in the field, I used to wear these boots, and I <laughs> thought they were the greatest things of all time. I used to run faster, I used to play better, so I used to love these mouldies. But then when we got to the, the new Cove Hark, you see, I think it was around 2002, when I was coming on the scene, and it was a different pitch that time where, I think it was, was it really hard or something underneath, but the, but the grass, there was plenty of grass on it, but there, were, there was a lot of slipping and sliding going on in, in the early years. So they were saying, even though we're in the height of the summer, you should wear your uh, long cogs. So I wore them in the semi-final of 2003, and I also wore them in the final, and I was took off in both, in both matches. So I said, I'm never wearing cogs again. And I wasn't after wearing them in a good few years. And um, so then, 2004, <laughs> I flirted the idea of wearing one of each. But you know what happened that day? I was sent off in the quarterfinal against Clare. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that put into all that. Back to the moldies. But uh, then I had a big scare. It wasn't my scare. It was 2004 semi-final against Watford. And uh, Mick Kavanagh comes up to me before the match. And he said, uh, what boot are you wearing today, Tommy? <laughs> and I said, uh, oh, I'm wearing the moldies. But I forgot to tell him it didn't matter what kind of weather's out there. I was going to wear moldies. So he said, right, right. Yeah. And he pawned the moldies and. It was about a minute to go, and I, a few minutes to go, and there wasn't much in it, probably only two pints. And Paul O'Brien, who's after having a great summer coming as I think, as a sub for Watford at that time, a ball came in behind me. I looked around, and here was Kevin on the ground. <laughs> I thought Paul O'Brien had a great chance of a goal, and I think our goalie saved it at the time. But yeah, that was my uh, story with boots. <laughs> and did Michael Kavanagh blame you afterwards about the Maldives? Yeah, sure, listen, we won, and there's a great picture of the two of us where our you probably see it on Google or one of these things where we were arms around each other and I think it was more relief that all worked out in the end than anything else. But uh, we were great friends. We probably just had plenty of slagging and jeering after it. Uh, that's um, uh, one of our highlights from earlier on in the year. Um, Tommy was part, we were in Kilkenny at the weekend and driving in and around the city and the uh, Intermediate Club Championship final was live on the radio and uh, Tullerone were hammering Greg Ballycallan. So he's from Tullerone, obviously the Walsh's. Greg Ballycallan is Eddie Brennan's team. And uh, we went off anyway, because we had a family thing on and came back out and the taxi driver hadn't heard the end of the match and told us, oh yeah, yeah, Tullerone won that. And then the next day I was looking it up and it was a, a massive scoring blitz of 1-4, 1-5 in the last three minutes. Got Greg Ballycallan over the line, so they got beaten in the county final at the weekend. 40 year old Eddie Brennan still doing his stuff. Yeah, apparently he was absolutely sensational. And centre forward. Conducting the orchestra. Um, so there you go. They won two sixteen to two thirteen. So I'd say it was um, a disappointing week in Tullerone and hurling history because they would have been getting back up senior if they'd yeah. done that. So what do you wearing the moldies. He can always console himself with his uh, Imro award. Oh yeah, very true. Actually, yeah. yeah. Has he got that yet? I don't think we handed it over. We need to do that as an official presentation. A ceremonial handing over. Right. So here's next. Uh, obviously, the hurling season had some amazing stories. None better than uh, the Limerick story. The morning after Limerick's All-Ireland hurling final victory, we had Kean Lynch on live from the team hotel and uh, we brought up the fact that his ma somehow managed to get her way through the security cordon and find him in the aftermath of the game. Have a look. Mother actually hopped over the fence and got onto the pitch in Crow Park yesterday. I'd say there's no warrant out for her, but uh, <laughs> you know, it means so much to everyone, like, which is unbelievable. So. I don't, know, I don't know if you've seen the photograph yet, but there's an amazing photograph of you and your mum just hugging oh, on the pitch. Is, is there, I didn't see it now at all. She probably has it already herself. Oh, it's, it's class. It's in the papers. It's, uh, it, oh, it, is it? Yeah, yeah. We, well, we found it on info anyway, so if we, if we'll send it to you. But it's yeah, just... It's be great. It's just brilliant. Do you remember... Did you talk to her? Do you remember anything you actually said to her? No. Even lads were saying what to feel like after the game. Like, but I kind of put the head down. I actually struggled to breathe for a few minutes, like, because... You're kind of saying, jeez, we're after winning all Ireland, like a dream, of, it's a dream come true. But I remember the mother, she jumped up out of nowhere and kind of, I grabbed her and just put the head on her shoulder. And it was actually a moment where I could actually just breathe for a second and kind of take in my own surroundings and realise, you know what, this is what it's about. You know, she was the woman that was there for me from the very beginning with the whole family, like, and just to see her there on the pitch, whether the shorts after or the shorts not, like, just see her smiling and going around to everyone. So it puts it all into perspective, really. 
I don't know if your phone is charged, but Tommy has just WhatsApped you the picture there if you want to have a look at it. I don't know if you're, uh, if you're getting photographs <laughs> or if you're... If well, you managed to plug it in last night, you were doing pretty well. well Tommy Rooney, hold on here now a second. There you go, that's <laughs> it. If that's the only message on his phone this morning, Mel, he hasn't... <laughs> I have another... Oh, jeez, I see it. Some hit me, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, yeah, that's, that's lovely now, fair enough, she'd be light of that. It is class, isn't it? It's amazing. Like, that's, that's one of the highlights of the, of the hurling summer right there. Just in that little moment. I love the fan footage that emerged from the crowd of her kind of getting through. That you could see somebody the next day was like, oh, hang on a second, and then you could identify Valerie running onto the pitch. Because um, security is obviously very tight, they don't want people on the pitch, but she managed to get through. They obviously knew who she was. Or what, is it, what, what would happen if they like if there was like a, a one size fits all policy and it was like well Maz are allowed let the Maz yeah. out yeah I think, I think yeah, that's fair a enough. secret un unuttered never no 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 completely denied but like but do these Maz have to have some sort of certificate with them some sort of biological passport like how anybody could hop on and say actually no I'm Keen Lynch's Ma. So you, there you has to be like, some sort of a screening process. You don't look like Keen Lynch's man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was sitting at home watching that show and I just thought, I know the self-praise is no praise given that I am an off-the-baller, but you just nailed it that morning. To get Keen Lynch sitting in the lobby and the, the line that clear and that moment with the photo, bravo. You were crying, really. were you? I wasn't crying that time. You had a little tear in your eye. No. I, I, I wondered, so she was obviously saying in the Hogan or in the Cusick, and she just hopped over, you know, the way they put those that netting over the first three rows. She like roll across that and flip and flip something like that. But basically, like I'm sure, like no disrespect to, to Valerie Lynch, but I'm sure every there's plenty of other people who'd be able to do what she did. Um, that basically, if you want to invade the pitch in Crow Park, it is possible. If there's a large groundswell of people in one section of the ground, it's doable. Yeah, I mean the Kerry Mafia. Eventually, when when Kerry stopped the ten in a row. You guys will all be there, battering, pounding away at the security guards, making your way on to embrace all the returning AFLers who have finally come back home to stop the in and stop the march of Dublin. That's a beautiful thought. I'm really looking forward yeah, to it. It does mean you're going to have to wait another six years. Andy Lee's done some great work with us over the, over the course of the last year, and uh, no more so than his um, brilliant interview with Seamus McDonough. McDonough was back in Ireland uh, during the summer, and he caught up with him for an interview, and they talked about his fight with Evander Holyfield. You could have been an inch either yes, way of, yeah. of either of you going down. Yeah. Would you believe I've thought about that for the last 25 years ago, 27 years ago, 28 years ago, Jeannie Mike. I've thought about that fight probably almost every day for the last 28 years, you know? Mm. It, it, like, it never leaves us. How does it, how does it sit with you now? Well... Of course, I always you know, kind of wish it was different, you know, and I wish I'd just calm down a bit and, and not try to knock out the number one habit in the world. <laughs> I wish I'd just uh, relax more and, and uh, take it easy and, and, uh, and just moved around, not try to knock them out, which is which a bit of an insane, uh, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> Will you try and move around, Tony? Is that, is that your plan? To not try to knock him out straight away? Uh, go through, straight through him, I think, <laughs> is the tactic. <laughs> That is a brilliant interview, by the way. If you haven't seen it, um, Simmons McDonough is one of those kind of... He's got that charisma. It's funny how a lot of boxers are performers. Like, you think about the fight game. Your job is to win the fight. But your job is also to make as much money as you can by fighting. And so, therefore, you automatically make more money if you're some, something of a performer, if you carry yourself as a performer. And um, he just had that kind of natural charisma that... It wasn't forced. And it seems to separate, it, like uh, maybe, maybe you only make it to a certain level because you have a, a charisma and I don't know what comes first. It must be, there has to be some truth in what you say there because it's so unusual that one sport at the very top echelons can have so many characters compared to literally every other sport. So there has to be some sort of uh, like link between your charisma and what that actually equates to in the ring. I guess you've got to be balls to put your head on the line like that. Like, and that, that comes from that sort of showmanship that, uh, that, that dictates charisma, I guess. I, you can only put yourself in a position for your charisma to take us further if you've got the ingrained talent at the start. Like, a showman at the age of 18, 19 is not going to find himself in a position to win a world title. But you can earn more and develop your 
boxing character far more than your talent maybe allows you to do if you're a talker, if you're brash, if you're a salesperson. So you need to be it helps. Like, like the David Beckham of, of boxing, really wonderful footballer, but got an awful lot more out of his talent than maybe his talent should have allowed him to. In terms of money? Yeah, in terms of money, the brand, um, the the longevity of his career. Now, he was an astonishingly hard, hard worker. That a lot of it goes into dedication as like, well. And you have to be hugely uh, admiring of the way Beckham kept himself. Like also an incredible athlete. Playing central midfield for PSG in the Champions League at the age of 35. Badly. Yeah, but yeah. Like he convinced somebody to put him in there. Yeah, it's yeah. not just about selling shirts. but like He's in the top 10 most famous footballers ever, is he? Oh, yeah. Oh, easily. Is he anywhere near as talented as the rest of the people who share that same label? Well, is, is he in, he's nowhere near the top 10 most talented footballers ever. There you, so you've got, you've got like the likes of Pele, Maradona, etc., etc., and David Beckham is I just as big a name. But oh, yeah, nowhere exactly. Nowhere near the level of talent. And there would be boxers, I, I'm, I, if those who know more about the fight game could probably come up with a better comparison to David Beckham, somebody who was. Yes, talented, but got far more out of the boxing career than maybe their talent would have suggested as they were entering the fray. I think they, they I mean, it's hard to know because in boxing, at least, there's the meritocracy of the really boring Eastern European <coughs> boxer who never speaks and is dour, or the Cuban who never speaks and is dour and who doesn't uh, thrill the crowd but kills you because he punches harder than you, faster than you, better than you. At least in football, you can hide within the team a little bit and the marketing can take off and it doesn't really matter if your team loses a game here or a game there or you miss a penalty, whatever. You get sent off in a big game. Marketing can recover, but if you keep getting beaten by the better boxer, you ain't going to be making the money for too long. So no. more, more meritocracy there. One final boxing piece for you. Niall Kennedy is a heavyweight boxer. He's also a guard, uh, Joe Conroy. And Andy went down to visit him in Wexford at a key moment in his life. Have a look. Victories, five of them coming my way of knockout. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the seven-time Irish national amateur champion and the current Massachusetts heavyweight state champion, hailing from Wexford, Ireland. Please welcome Niall Boom Boom Kennedy. One of the not the reason I had to talk to you, but the Sanchez, uh, the Santos fight, mm. huge fight. Yeah, massive big, fight, yeah. Big, you took a big chance. Took a risk, yeah. yeah. No one told me it was as big a risk, but yeah, I took well, it, yeah. Huge underdog going over there. Mm. And not only all that on your mind, you had a, your son was born, yeah. MJ, uh, prematurely. Yeah. He was, was in the hospital. Would you say, bat, like, he was fighting for his life, battling? He, wa he was at that stage, yeah. He would have been, so he would have still been in in the intensive care unit in the neonatal ward. Yeah. So he was he was in hospital for 55 days in total. Oh no, his arm. His arm. That's how big his arm was when he was yeah. born. And they usually, they leave him loose fitting, don't they? Yeah. yeah. And did you watch the fight? No. <laughs> no. no. Do you ever watch him fight? No. Yeah. I, the night he was fighting, um, I, had, I was in, I had to express every three hours for MJ. So I woke up and I checked my phone and the, the fights were on yeah. and he was literally just about to come into the ring so I had my iPhone on my pillow I had the fight on that and I put Coronation Street on my, my iPad and watched Coronation Street and every few minutes I'd check over to see if he was still alive but I just I hate, I hate watching I hate watching it really do I was walking yeah, it's uh, understandable enough, I suspect. Uh, so, still unbeaten. Um, now, 11 and 1, I think. Uh, 11 wins and 1 draw. That's um, Niall Kennedy. And Carmen had a bit of a career from fighting generally in the States, um, almost exclusively since um, over the last two years. So, you know, building up a little bit of a following and hopefully getting an opportunity to make a payday once or twice. That kind of would be amazing for him at this stage. Does yeah, he sell? Is he a seller? He could potentially be. Like, I think... Uh uh, in terms of an amicable character, he definitely has that. But it is amazing watching some of his fights in some of the arenas, if you can use that term, that he, he fights in, like ballrooms in the Deep South and things like that. It's uh, it's quite the career, it's quite the journey, and hopefully it kind of materialises in that big payday, which would be fantastic for him. Because I think he's just one of those Irish boxers we can all get behind. Totally, yeah. So let's move on. Irish football, it's obviously not been the best uh, 12 months since we went on air. Basically, uh, have we won a game? Moldova. Any other games? Wales. USA. USA. 
No, since... Since not, we've been on air. Since, uh, Wales uh, was November, wasn't it? Was it? No. I think Playoffs. It was just, oh, sorry, yeah. No, was it? Oh, no, no. The playoffs were November then. The Welsh, the Welsh game in Cardiff just didn't make the one-year window. Didn't. No. No, you're, you're running uh, <laughs> uh, Tommy's in. Denmark away was our first game. It's been a tough year or so in Irish football, <laughs> but God didn't everything look so rosy when OTBAM began last Halloween, it says here. Here's what happened when we sent Nathan, Joe and Kev to Copenhagen for the first leg. Oh, how full of hope and piss and vinegar we were of last year's World Cup playoff against Denmark. I do think we'll do it, and I'm, I'm very positive. I see. I'm probably too, the, my, my problem being is I'm, I'm probably too positive. That's the thing. Okay, hey where's this confidence come from that we're going to get through? All of a sudden? Ah, never mind you. Um, <laughs> where's the confidence come from? I don't know. I, I think it's it. I don't know. Ult, ultimate optimist. I think that's what it is, Joe. Jeez. <laughs> So, I'm not saying Copenhagen is expensive, but we have just spent the entire off-the-ball budget on this cup of coffee and this little old flat white. I'm going to go 14 euro for the two of them. No, no. Uh, Malmo is... You, you, you sound like you've been talking to Kevin Kilbane, who has done nothing but bitch and moan about the fact that we're staying in a different... We're staying in a completely different country to where the match is on. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here, it's cheaper here though, isn't it? Honestly, yeah, God. Yeah, we're staying here, yeah. It's been down the road, isn't it? So we come to the big playoff game, big World Cup playoff game, and some bright spot decides, I'll tell you what, we're gonna stay in Malmo not Copenhagen. So that's what Nathan decides to do, put us in a different country. So here we are, crossing the bridge, crossing the border here, between uh, Malmo all the way into Copenhagen now. So I thought when I was booking this, this was the smart option, uh, but nobody else seems to agree as uh, I'm just name dropping here on Thursday night when we had Peter Schmeichel at the roadshow we were, Peter was asking where we're staying in Copenhagen and I said Malmo and uh, the look yeah. in his face was, was akin to the look in his face when I asked him about Roy Keane. He just sort of stared at me, stared right through me for about uh, three minutes and he didn't think it was a good idea and nobody we've met since thought it was a good idea. It's not a good idea because they've got different currencies, which doesn't help matters. It's, it's, it's very confusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the bridge, obviously, I, I, I'm only putting this together now, um, the eponymous bridge that is the uh, detective series I don't know if you're into your Danish TV, but it's brilliant. I'm familiar with it, but I've never watched it. Oh, uh, Borgen is brilliant. Uh, the bridge is also stunningly good, right? And there's always a murder involving the bridge, or kind of where there needs to be cross cooperation between the Malmo police and the Copenhagen police, which obviously, as you can imagine, is a culture clash. It's like, you know, traditional 1970s detective series set up here where these two people aren't going to get along, and the, the tension comes from that. But if I, you know, the bridge, obviously, it's like a, there's always murder there. Irish football murdered. Well, by the Danes, but ultimately by the Danes in that series. My favorite part of that video is Nathan's phone face. I wonder to see like uh, pull those expressions every time he's on the phone. <laughs> what was he doing? Just kind of like being like oh, it was as if he was like a pan in a, playing in a, in a pantomime. Except the person on the other line obviously couldn't hear him because the phone was up to his ear. But it's just just one observation of many that you can make from that video. A, a, a thrilling piece of work. Okay. There you go. Wow, shots fired by, I mean, it's like... It was true. It it's was. almost like he's, he's in the constant... The murder, murder occurs in that bridge. It's, it is constant thrilling. Constant hype mode now. Uh, okay, so we obviously weren't at the World Cup. Uh, we did make sure that we didn't miss out on any of the memories. Here's John Duggan. Good morning, guys. Dobro Ucha from Russia. It's like any other global city in the world, lads. It's just right. the Baltimore hat, and I'm putting it on right now. It's not like the Bourne identity, folks. <laughs> it's, it's, it's another global city like any other... I never thought I would wear this hat. I bought it when I bought the Yushanka. Uh, but I, I, given the day that's in it and what's happened here in the last 24 hours, I had to take out the hat and wear it today. So, uh, yeah, it's just... What, 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 what a day. What a day for Russia. I, Good afternoon yourself. Uh, tell us about Ulyanovsk, John, uh, because this is something that's come onto our radar today and we're all very intrigued by this. Yeah, it's a city kind of not too far from Kazan in Russia and is where Lenin was born, of course, the revolutionary leader. And I've got contacts over here, and uh, I've been offered the freedom of the city of Ulyanovsk. How do you actually become, how do you get the freedom of a city, a massive city with 600,000 people of a population? This is no little village, John. Like, how, how do you get approached? Do you make an inquiry? 
I was just told that the freedom has been offered by who? Um, by the mayor, mayoral office. The mayor uh, of the so, town, the, not the actual mayor. Uh, <laughs> you know, don't don't be quizzing me. Don't be quizzing me like <laughs> well, that. Prime time journalist. <laughs> so, oh, and you know, it's not prime time. You know, you know, when the ceremony <laughs> happens, you'll find out. We'll get all the information for you. We'll get you the. Well, we'll show you the, the papers that be stamped and all the ceremonial uh, scrolls and everything. So you know, let's just chill out until it happens. Well, this is a very important building behind me, lads. It's the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. This was the residence of the monarchy in Russia. It was the capital of Russia, St. Peter. Yeah, beautiful buildings. Beautiful, yeah. Beautiful, happy times. I, my heart is gladdened revisiting those memories of speaking to John Duggan every morning and afternoon. I loved it. He was, um, he was one of the bright leading lights of the summer. i kind of forgotten that the World Cup was this year. It's like, it's I had serious just, culture, culture envy watching all of that. Yeah. Uh, as I did. He covered sure. it all. Yeah, he, he had everything. He said the food was bad, <clears throat> which uh, obviously kind of punctured my culture envy <laughs> to a certain extent. Uh, he says that actually, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to disclose information, he said that he lived off Western food for most of his time over there. So, you know, he thought it, it, it was an authentic World Cup di- diary. But then he better think again. In fairness, he, he fessed up to that the whole way through. <laughs> Like, I must have just drifted off during those sections. <laughs> All right, former Irish Celtic and Man United midfielder Liam Miller passed away on the 8th of February this year at the age of 36. Having left a young family behind, a tribute match was organised in his memory for September. And if you remember, there was a massive controversy around this, which all now seems to have been a whole storm about nothing and just chronically mishandled on one side. Uh, 1.5, 1.6 million, a million is going into a... Uh, fund for the Miller family, so unbelievably successful, a real outpouring of emotion from the people of Cork and from the wider country as well. Ultimately, the game does get fixed for Porky Cueve. Um, this is what Damien Duff had to say on OTB AM back in August. I think it's a disgrace. I think it's uh, Gaelic people and uh, whoever makes the decision sign real books and they don't have their AGM till next February. It's a load of crap. It's archaic. Uh, you know, it's just Dinosaurs making decisions, you know. A young man has passed away, left a young family behind, and uh, all they're looking to do is play a game that will bring people together. Firstly, it would be a, you know, a lovely occasion and will help Lee Mar- Miller's family. So I just find it absolutely disgraceful that they can't open the gates of their stadium for uh, for one day. So I think I don't know. I don't read media or whatever. I'd like to think that's what everyone's feelings is on it, but I find it a disgrace, and it's just. Same old dinosaurs in GAA making the same old decisions. Are you surprised by what's happened? Um, I am. I am. So, you know, you hear a lot about the GAA people. Yeah, I know they opened Crow Park for, for the senior internationals years back, but, you know, it's absolutely ridiculous. Like I said, it's just a game of football. Um, and that's all I can call them, dinosaurs. So, uh I don't know, they're hinting now that they might open their doors. Uh, I don't know, it's PR-wise, I think it's been awful for GAA, and rightly so. Mm. The thing is, it could have been such an easy PR win for them as well had they made the U-turn straight away. Yeah. Oh, listen, even if they open the doors now and the game is played uh, there, I still think they come out of it looking awful. So it's a lose-lose for them now, and it serves them right. So, um, So it makes my blood boil, and I can only imagine how... Everyone on the committee feels about it as well. Um, so, absolute disgrace, but not really surprised. Luckily, somebody within the GA did step in and find a way for the right decision to be made. And ultimately, it was a good day for Parky Cueve and a good day for the city and a good day for the stadium and for the investment in the stadium. But I do think that stuff like Damien Duff helped to just make sure that everybody was galvanised and go. There was a bit of a backlash to Duff, like, oh, you can't, the FAI, what about? Which, like, is my favourite. <laughs> what about? <laughs> the, the, thing, the, the, the players were, uh, were all in favour of Parky Cueve, and then they immediately regretted calling for Parky Cueve as soon as they were out on the massive surface. <laughs> and they were tired as they've ever been. Um, but uh, ultimately, it, uh, it worked out for the best, I think, for everyone. And that, like, the game, the amount of money that was raised <clears throat> and the memories from the day are the thankfully the lasting memories of that entire project. But God, remember that week when the GA just made well, such a mistake. And it would fortunately for the GA, it was at a time where it was not just the only controversy that was kind of doing the rounds at the time. There were New Bridge and Nowhere was, was New Bridge and Nowhere in there as well, and um, it just was not a. It wasn't a good fortnight for them, and 
yeah, they made the right call in the end, but I remember there was a statement released where they, they talked about how they had sought legal advice yeah. on the matter and it was just not the right tone. Tony Lean, um, in his piece today, talking about the... So the committee held a press conference yesterday and um, Michael Flynn revealed how much money has been raised and the various other charities that are going to benefit from it. Um, he was saying that already Parky Cueve and Munster are in conversation about potentially having... Uh, if there's a relevant Heineken Cup semi-final there at some point. Because, you know, you can't have a semi-final in your home stadium, you need yeah. to nominate a stadium. That would be amazing. But, like, we need to get to that point where it's a phone call as opposed to a national outpouring of annoyance, yeah. pissed-offness. Everybody kind of sees this as a community facility. We're now... Uh, the, the GA are going to use that facility to raise money to help pay for the coaching in the Munster region. Like, it makes perfect sense for everybody. Yeah, it does. And look, ultimately, when we're looking back in it, the GA made the right decision in both cases. Now, it took a little bit of pressure, but they did make the right decision, and they were in a position where they were willing to back down. You could say that they were where they left with any wriggle room when it came to that, but the GA did make the right call. Somebody in, in the GA decided, we need to have a look at this. Ultimately, Kildare played Mayo on Newbridge, and the Liam Miller tribute match was played in Parky Cueve, and that's what the history books will tell us. Staying with GAAM, if it's Morris stepped aside this summer and granted Owen and OTBAM the exclusive interview about why this in particular was a standout moment for their 40-minute carry love-in. Something that changed this summer was players and a player, one player in particular, that got a letter, and it was more what was in the letter that was what annoyed me, and I felt it was gone too far. That the player was told in the letter uh, to jump off a cliff and take three or four other players with him that were named in the letter, and um, I felt that that was, you know, going way too far. And uh, as I said, when it's when it's coming at a manager and the selectors got a few this summer as well, which was no harm for them either to get a to get a touch of it. But um, uh, when it goes to a player, really, it's got it's gone too far. Yeah, look, it was great to get that insight and to see exactly the <coughs> level of stress that these managers are under and the players are under. Um, and I do think Amy Morris is going to be a brilliant pundit wherever he ends up over the next while, uh, explaining what it's like to be trying to stop Dublin, what your plan might be how the kick-out strategy impacts as opposed to the type of, some of the type of punditry that we see where it's like broad brush strokes, paint, paint, paint by numbers, have a bit of a row and off you go. Because I think that, I think, I hope that has had a day. Yeah, I was in Fitzgerald Stadium that night when they hammered Kildare, but you knew with half an hour remaining in the game that it wasn't going to be their day because Monaghan were giving Galway the mother of all thrashings in Salt Hill. What were Galway thinking? What the hell were they thinking? I still get pissed off about that. I mean, you should. What the hell were they thinking? <laughs> what well, were they thinking? Oh, let's play a game against Dublin next. But uh, what, but they st they, they picked a strong team, yeah, exactly. Though. Yeah. Yeah, but they didn't go for it. When you when you they say were what were they thinking, you literally mean what were they thinking? Like, in that their mindset on the night was just not what it needed to be. Easy, ozy. Like we don't need to win this game. But you see, they didn't need to win it. That, yeah, yeah. That was like, the problem. They for them. absolutely did. You have to avoid Dublin. Get they, Dublin in the Ireland final. They were better off. Dublin, Dublin have underperformed the Ireland finals versus the quality of the games that we've seen them play. But no, I don't think Even any the Galway Toronto. players. It, all the right things would have been said in the Galway camp in the build-up to the game. We don't want to play Dublin. We're going to go out and hammer Monaghan. We're going to show everybody we are what we think we are. This and is our stadium. Developed. Exactly. But then ultimately, when you have to go and win that 50-50 challenge. It's, your heart's just not in it. And Monaghan needed to win, in yeah. fairness. You've got to give them credit for that performance as well that evening. The pitch invasion at the end of the game was one of the moments of the summer ah, as well. Ah, without question. But I was down in the bells of Fitzgerald Stadium waiting for Fitzmaurice to come out and talk to us. And the rumour started to filter through that he has had a long conversation. Right. His little girl and his wife are down in the dressing room as well. And he has told them he will not be there next year. And it was an emotional evening. I'd like to have seen one last crack with that carry team against the dubs. Like, it would have been a far better All-Ireland final, semi-final sequence. Kerry, Dublin, <coughs> ultimately, Dublin, Galway in the final. You want to see Clifford against Dublin sooner rather than later? Yeah. In Croke Park on a dry day? Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, uh, th I think that's one of the reasons why it was a very unfulfilling football championship across the year. There was no heavyweight clash, because we've been reduced to three heavyweight teams. Well, one, really. 
Like there was no heavyweight clash because there was only one heavyweight. The best um, four, the best four teams rate made it to the All. I don't know. I don't know, but like I don't ah, know about that though. I, I, I think if you had any combination of Dublin Mayo or Kerry in an All Ireland semi final or final, it would have made a better game than literally any, any other game that we saw this summer. I think so. I agree. Uh, one last clip for you here before we get into two final stories. Kenny Cunningham has brought us some amazing moments in the show over the last year. Too many to bring you right now. Maybe we'll do a full special Kenny Christmas special. We will. <laughs> we will. I promise you now. Kenny's Christmas special coming to you the week of Christmas when you're hungover on your way into work on I Can't Face This. We will give you an hour and a half of pure, unadulterated joy that week, I promise you, after your Christmas party. And it'll be there, a repository of Kenny's goodness forever that no one can ever take down. Unless, of course, he's libeled somebody. But anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> most of them were too long-winded to find a short clip, obviously, as well. Except for this one. It was uh, when Kenny met Kenny, Richard Cooper, in studio, alongside Kenny Cunningham, playing Kenny Cunningham. Like, to some people, like, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was so on that. Mike get bothered about with this particular moment in time. <laughs> no, but at the same time, we've got to move on. You've got to park it and move on. You know, it doesn't bother me at this particular moment in time. <laughs> Well, he can't, after the game last night, my mum was watching. She said, I thought you were taking you while it was Keith Andrews. Oh, she right. Said, yeah, she yeah, said, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I was in the kitchen, I could hear it. Yeah. I thought, said, why are you taking off, why are you taking off Ken yeah. on the after a match? Like, she thought it was the similarities between the way yeah. uh, Keith Key, And the hairstyle, pitch. obviously, was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the week, that's the week. Come on, you lay yourself down there. <laughs> no, well, you you see guys the, are better than me, the pitch. You the, know better than me. Yeah, no, well, the, you know, the, uh, the, the wig that we use for Keith Andrews, I mean, it's, 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 I look like somebody from The Cure. Like, I look like <laughs> Rob Smith from The Cure. But it's hard to exaggerate his hair. Yeah. He has He's an incredible hair. set of hair. He's got great hair. Great He's got hair. Great hair to be there. But even when he cuts it short, like even if it's like a crew cut for you and me, it still still seems to be kind of like <laughs> fulsome. Yeah, fulsome. It's a joy for you. I bet you were delighted when you saw he was uh, he was on the panel for the summer, weren't you? Straight Absolutely. Away. Yeah, I think he's very good. Honestly, yeah. I do. I think he's yeah. very composed and and because I don't. I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't think it's easy to slot in there with you know, you know, certain people who only give you a certain slot, uh, <laughs> give you a certain amount of time, and if they don't take to you. You know, they make your life very, very difficult. Ah, that is the word I spoke true in jest. Ah, <laughs> we started letting everybody in a bit of gossip there. That's good stuff. Uh, David Chee has been in touch. We're going to do some of these comments for you. Uh, Listen to you about the Wicklow GA fixtures first. Loud had a seven-week gap between the groups and the quarterfinals in the Senior Football Championship. And in Meath, we were only a draw or two away from a team being out two days running. Hashtag OTBAM. Uh, Gary O'Toole, not that Gary O'Toole, says, uh, Drugs and sport are rife. When was the last high-profile positive test? Amazing. Well, it's money. If you've got money, you don't get... Um you don't get the drugs that they test for because you get access to the new good drugs and the new compound drugs that are like untestable and undetectable and have been for years. So uh, the richest people win in uh, sport by having the best drugs. Uh, on the FAI IFA joint bid, I don't think the proposed new stadiums at Drogheda, Daily Night and Donegal will all be ready for 2021. Where are the games being played? At a 70% empty Aviva. It's 2021 or 2023, isn't that the two years that we're going for? It's not. It's not a guarantee that we're going to get to 2021. So 2021, I would assume. I'd is only the, seen 21, yeah. but maybe. Oh, I thought there was a, an option to a, apply for two. Sorry, yeah, for either the 2021 or the 2023 finals. So you buy yourself is. an extra 18 months there to get stuff ready. Many are required to stage the tournament. Yeah, it's an under 21 European Championship. We're we talking 10, six. I don't know how many games there are, but it's not like a 42 team competition. Are we talking a GAA buy-in? An IRFU buy-in? Potentially. I mean, so Ravenhill. I mean, will the sports ground be developed at that stage? Thomond Park, Musgrave Park, Ravenhill, I, Windsor Park. I suspect Park, some RDS. of those are too big. I suspect some of those stadia are too big. You yeah, want. it's like up to 38,200 is the, the capacity cap in this. Kingspan Stadium, of course, before anybody gets in touch. Is that going to be... Oh, Kingspan. Oh, yeah, sorry. Ravenhill. I've never heard of Ravenhill. Uh, right, uh, Darrow Toole says on Joe Schmidt's future. Sorry, I missed one there. Ben Woods on Twitter says St. Patrick's had to play eight games to win a championship containing twelve teams in a dual county. To me, that's a glorified league. Well, leagues are great. Get rid of the actual league. Just play the championship as league, and on we go. Darrow Toole says on Joe Schmidt's future. Ian Foster is in line for the All Blacks job. Should Hanson leave, yeah, they wouldn't the begrudge Hanson yeah. a third ter term either. No, Hanson gets the pick if he's sticking or going. So if he decides to stick then all the dominoes fall. And maybe that's a conversation that's had over dinner after Ireland and the All Blacks. 
So, Steve, what's your plans? Any plans, Steve? Anything you want to tell me? Unless they lose by a point in the World Cup final, then it's not his decision. Then he's betrayed everybody in New Zealand yeah, but with a horrible tenure. Joe will have made his call at that stage. Yeah. Like... I mean, it's a weird situation, isn't it? Where it's like you're left hanging on. Who? Everybody. Us or Joe? Yeah, we're left hanging on. Really. Well, we won't be. If not, if it's, not if it is as um, Darcy said in his piece and the RFU have said recently that we will know by Christmas. It's true. After the November internationals, anyway. Um, English football stopping players leaving. Paul McCabe says, Gary Breen plays for England, plays amazing, gets a move to a big club, becomes a 50 million centre back. Hashtag O2BAM. I mean, it is possible. That, like, if Breen comes through the English system the whole way through, you know, he's captain of the under-21 team, and so Liverpool spent five and a half million on him in 98, 97, and so therefore he gets capped because that's how it works. That crappy English players get bigger transfers even back then than they deserved. Yeah, well, I, there's no question that Gary would be, would have been more heavily rewarded as a player if he had played for England. And also... How many times would he have played for them? And when you think of someone like Gary or Kevin, Aldridge, all these boys, when they look back what they've got out of the Irish experience, like way goes way beyond their days. As Absolutely, a and uh, not, I'm they'd com- never have got that otherwise. Completely parking that, but like there is the possibility that you know Gary Breen was a ball playing centre back. That England team had some players who could play football. He might have been the perfect solution for them. Him and Rio Ferdinand could have been, or him and John Terry could have been a perfect partnership that some manager decides this is what we want. I mean, it's unlikely, but it's not impossible. Um, Andy Mullins says, I reckon Cabal would have got a few caps during the England's left sided problem era around 2002, the Trevor Sinclair years. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor Sinclair had that one goal that one time. Yeah. Like, Killer would have played on the left side of midfield for them. Didn't Paul Scholes end up playing there for a large portion of his England career? Would Scholes have been on the bench while Kilban was rampaging down the left side of the England attack? Who played left mid for England in the 2002 World Cup? Was it? it was a Trevor. Like, the only kind of outlier that I would say from the 2002 team would be kind of Danny Mills at right back because Gary Neville was injured. Didn't they play 3-5-2? Maybe they did then. Uh, in Japan and Korea? But Campbell... Ferdinand and Wayne Bridge. Wayne Bridge would have been the left side of that five, yeah. Ashley Cole. Ashley Cole. Ashley Cole, right. Danny Mills, Saul Campbell, Rio Ferdinand. This team doesn't make any sense. Is there a third centre half there? No. No, I'm pretty sure they played uh, fairly orthodox at the time, like whatever it may be in a four four two or four four one one. Beckham, Trevor Sinclair, Owen Hargreaves comes on for him. Um, Is he both on that team? Nicky Butt is a sub, I think. I don't know, Nicky Butt's picked. So Nicky Butt very post good goals. Nicky yeah, best player in the world, according to Pele, after that. <laughs> that was, uh, okay, you, you, you stick to advertising the, uh, the Mickey juice. <laughs> <laughs> what are you? <laughs> so Tommy shouting a full team in my ear here. <laughs> Trevor Sinclair was playing that. against Brazil. Left midfield. There you go. Okay. You go. So Kilban gets in ahead of. Singer. Kieran Dyer's in that squad. Darius Vassell, Joe Cole, Gareth Southgate's in the 2002 squad. Oh, yeah. But I think, you know, at that stage of Southgate's career, Martin Keown also at that stage of his career, they're old, aren't they? One 31 and 35. It's not like Kilban's an off the ball if he's played in, in, in that World Cup hey. for <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wes Brown, Robbie Fowler, Trevor Sinclair starts as a sub against, um, uh, against Argentina but obviously plays his way into the team. So Hargreaves must have started because they must have had skulls. Stephen Reid, would he have made the England squad? Fit and England declared? Not in 2 Well, he played for us in 2 Yeah. And he had a really good World Cup. But not in 2 I don't think at that stage he was just, like, he was a bolter at that point and still at Millwall, right? Yeah, he was, yeah. So, Joe Cole, obviously the captain of West Ham at that point. But here's the thing, if they're, I, I don't know, like, Stephen Reid wasn't in the Ireland squads as a teenager. Didn't come up through the system. The so way he may have been fed through the England system had he not declared for us. Anyway, it still leads us going all the way back probably to John Aldridge. Andy Dunleavy says, Happy birthday, guys. Hashtag go to BAM. Richard Kearney, congrats on 12 months. Greatest sports pundits in media. How many hours of sport do you guys watch a week? Um, 
Not but enough. No, yeah, not enough. Also, not willing to um, make that information public. <laughs> I'm gonna get in too much trouble. Seamus Bannon, how are you, Seamus? You've been a bit of a naughty boy, haven't you? Giving the Bannons bad names all around the world. Oh no, that was. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, hashtag Kenny's Christmas Crackers. <laughs> That's the name. Hashtag OTBAM. Dermot Bannon. John that sounds Bannon? filthy. Kenny's Christmas Crackers. Does it? Is it not? Not at all. All right. Uh, Viva OTBAM. <laughs> He's lost the plot over here on his birthday. <laughs> Viva OTBAM. Viva Piss and Vinegar, says our man Bubber Graham on uh, Periscope. Thanks for watching, Graham, this morning. We were in touch with Graham uh, back and forth last night about the possibility of uh, organising the screening for his new documentary, so we're going to get uh, straight on that immediately after the show this morning. you got one final story for us. Just one last thing. Matt Doherty uh, in the... Irish Daily Mail, he's got an exclusive interview where he plays golf with uh, Laurie Whitwell, the journalist here. Uh, they're already pretty handy at the old golf, apparently. He easily wins her game to chip into the 50-yard basket first, but his mind is never far away from Wolves. Um, he talks about, basically, uh, his first conversation with Nuno Espirito Santo and asked how his body fat was. Uh, obviously, Espirito Santo kind of knew that he was carrying a little bit too much body fat there and uh, he knew he needed to change so uh, that was June 2017 he said and Doherty reckons he weighed 89 kg equivalent to 14 stone uh, he used to sit next to Danny Bass in the changing room and he was vegan he, I thought maybe I'll try it the best shape I've ever been 86.5 kg I've got quite big legs at my most I was 91, 92 I must have been a pudding he elongates the vowel for effect in his deep Dublin accent says uh, the author here uh, I used to not eat that well I would have microwavable dinners like pasta it was mix him with your fizzy drinks and sweets. No good. My missus, Nikia, cooks. Uh, technically, I'm pescatarian now, as I love prawns. And I still have the odd fizzy drink after a game. I'm not a saint. So, uh, good insight into Matt Doherty's diet there. Pescatarian is uh, the way to go, lads. So, 92 kgs versus 86 kgs, 5.5 kgs, 6.5 kgs. Tell me, what, uh, explain kgs and pounds. What's this? What is this? Like, how big? Significant? Stone lighter? Um... <coughs> Is there six kilos in a stone? I doubt it's a stone lighter. I think it is, yeah. No? I don't, I don't know. I still I still operate, I know what I am kgs, but I still operate in uh, old money. Would you consider going pescatarian? I had never heard of that term until you just read it. 13 and a half pounds, so exactly a stone lighter. So being the only meat-based food that you consume is fish. Uh, so yeah. That's what that means. Yeah. Um, I've never, I've, I, uh, I don't eat enough fish as it is, to be honest. Right. But I would find it difficult to turn my back on beef and lamb and all those good things. <laughs> chili, no more chili, no more steak. I'd love to be vegan. I think it would be great, but I just I wouldn't have the discipline for it. I'd just be, what uh, would be I'd, great about it? Well, you'd be healthy. Oh, yeah, there is that. I'd be eating a, bo a bowl <laughs> of uh, falafel for breakfast, dinner and tea. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, thanks very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Best of luck. Oh, congratulations, Dave. Yeah. There's, an, pastor, under, there's an underlying significance to your tone. A reminder, OGBAM is live with Screwfix.ie, championing the trade <laughs> with the choice for 20,000 quality trade products. This might be the last show we do together for a while. Uh, yeah, for a while maybe, but definitely not the last show we do together. <clears throat> you know, it just won't happen as frequently. There you go. What's rare is beautiful. Right, that's it from us this morning. Lots more happening off the ball today. Uh, keep an eye on all of our channels. The OTB AM podcast is up on Spotify now too. And uh, if you missed anything from the show earlier today, you can listen to the podcast wherever you want to. Tonight on Off the Ball from 7pm, Ronan O'Gara, Alan English's Stand Up and Fight and Monday Night Rugby. No, it's Wednesday Night Rugby because it's a Wednesday night. That's the end of OTB AM's first year. We'll see you for the second year. Bright Eyed and Bushy Tail tomorrow. Good luck. OTB AM. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a dedicated call centre.